Uh, good morning, everyone. It's just gone nine o'clock, so we'll get the hearing underway for the application from Dunedin City Council to develop a landfill at Smooth Hill, Dunedin. Uh, my name's Rob Van Vorthausen. I'm an independent hearings commissioner based in Napier, and I'd get my colleagues to introduce themselves to you, commencing on my right. Morning, all. I'm Jan Coulter. I'm uh, a lawyer working in the uh, Sorry, start again. Jan Caunter is my name. I'm an RMA lawyer, uh, also do commissioner work, obviously, and I'm based up in Tauranga in the Bay of Plenty these days. Used to be in Wanaka. Kia ora koutou. Kia ora koutou. Uh, my name is Ros Day Cleveland. Um, I'm based in Dunedin. I'm a planner. Um, and I um, am also doing some commissioner work, fairly. Um, nice to be here. Thank you. And now we're going to have a health and safety briefing. Okay, and if anyone has any queries about process or administration matters, then um, Karen down the back and Tasman, hands up. So these are the people you should see if you have any queries regarding administrative matters. And just before we uh, hear from the applicant, uh, Section 42A, reporting officers, can you introduce yourselves to the proceedings and explain your roles, please? Kia ora, Hilary Lennox. I'm a consultant planner um, engaged by the Tiger Regional Council on the Section 42A report writer. Uh, Kia ora, my name is Tisa Lindsay, I'm a consultant planner engaged by DCC, uh, Visitory, um, Chief Grace Mr. Casey. Um, I'm Michelle Mallet, uh, Staff Sales for the uh, Otago Regional Council. Thanks. And just before I do turn to the applicant, anything from the 42A officers for us this morning that you wish to draw to our attention? No, great. Right, over to the applicant. Um, happy for you to introduce yourself to us and then um, proceed to hear the case. Well, kia ora koutou, uh, and good morning commissioners, good morning everybody. My name's Michael Garbett, I'm council appearing for Dunedin City Council in its capacity as applicant. Uh, sitting with me is Ms Rebecca Kindiak, assisting me also as council. Uh, we have various staff and witnesses here for the applicant uh, and they'll they'll present their evidence in, in turn. Do you presume you don't want to have them introduced at this stage? No, we're very happy for you to introduce them um, as and when you call them. And just yes. to let you know and all the other participants know, we thank you and everyone else for the amount of pre-circulated material. Thank you for providing that. So anything that's been pre-circulated, including legal submissions, we've read in full. Uh, so they, that doesn't need to be read out loud to us again because that would be a waste of our time because we've already read it. Uh, but with yourself and other participants, you're all welcome to highlight key points for us uh, and then we will see if we have questions for you. So maybe if, um, when you call your witnesses, if you could just remind them of the fact that we have read everything that's been pre-circulated. Yes, no, they're, they're well aware of that. Thank you very much. All right, so um, I've circulated this morning to you, commissioners, and to anyone who wants it, a list of the order of witnesses. Uh, that's the plan for the applicant. The only... Uh, thing to note in that Sam Webb, who's number six on the list, is unavailable today. Uh, assuming we get to her, uh, we plan to uh, postpone her to tomorrow, uh, but otherwise we'll work through that order uh, subject to any other unforeseen circumstances. Um, attached to that um, handout are three relevant plans that I just want to draw your attention to, and these are plans that have all been part of the application <coughs> and evidence, but they're really some of the critical ones um, and I just wanted them in front of you because they'll be referred to and uh, regularly, I suspect. The first one is the general arrangement plan that shows the, the site, the, the designation boundary in red, 
uh, and all the key aspects of the proposal, uh, including the staff facilities, uh, the landfill footprint to mark the uh, wetland and the tributaries and the gullies. Now, turning over the page, the second plan is the road realignment plan and this is the detailed plan that demonstrates that the alignment up McLaren Gully Road has been narrowed to ensure that there's no impact on the roadside wetlands uh, to ensure that those wetlands are avoided. It does require some narrowing through that uh, section shown in the middle uh, to achieve that, uh, to ensure that the wetlands aren't impacted directly at all. And then thirdly, the final plan is the one from the Ecologist Evidence, which uh, really demonstrates the location of the swamp wetland at the base of the landfill tow, uh, and also depicts uh, the names of the gullies that have been used throughout the evidence, West Gully 3, uh, Upstream West Gully 3, West Gully 4 and West Gully 4. Um, so that's where those names have come from. You will have obviously seen in evidence. I'm well conscious you've read the legal submissions and I certainly don't plan to read those to you, but there are some aspects I do wish to highlight and particularly uh, I just want to stress the changes to the application that have been made since lodgement, so you are fully au fait with those. Um, and those are twofold. The, the primary change uh, when the application was re-lodged uh, in May of 2021 was to reduce the landfill footprint to pull it back up the hill slightly to avoid any direct impact on that swamp wetland. Uh, that's had a range of consequences for the design, including obviously the size and capacity of the landfill footprint, uh, but also some of the, the general arrangement plan was, was altered slightly just to accommodate that uh, reduced footprint. So that's one of the key changes and I know you, you've, you've seen that in the application. The second obviously is one I've alluded to in terms of the road widening and well, the road narrowing to avoid wetlands. That's obviously been a consequence of the NES fresh water that was promulgated by Parliament subsequent to the application being lodged. Uh, so that's uh, caused the applicant to reflect on those provisions, uh, making prohibited activity status for direct earthworks within the wetland requiring, at least from our point of view, those changes to the application. Um, I've set out in the submissions the relevant statutory assessment and statutory criteria that you need to have regard to. Um, they all stem from this application being discretionary activity and I'm not aware of anyone taking any issue with that activity status and I've set out uh, why that is and why it remains discretionary despite the NES freshwater coming into effect post-lodgement. Um, one thing I will say about the statutory criteria, which I didn't uh, put in my written outline, is that uh, you'll probably not find previous cases, decisions, decisions of the Environment Court or higher courts of particular help in this case. This is an unusual application, it's not one that's made regularly, it's a big application and it's particularly site specific uh, in terms of its uh, design, the proposal and also its assessment of effects. So you will have noted uh, the cases I've referred to throughout the legal submissions uh, draw on some of the normal principles that apply on certain topics and issues, uh, but there's no particular one case in my submission that uh, has a direct uh, analogous uh, precedent to this particular application. I think your task is to uh, apply the statutory criteria, assess the relevant provisions of the policy framework, consider the effects and exercise your discretion uh, to grant or refuse and if grant impose conditions. I moved in my written outline to address key issues of effects and in my submission this is the key issue for, for you in this case to understand the evidence, to assess the effects and to uh, look at those in light of the statutory framework. And as I said in the written 
opening, um, the applicants, experts and team have focused particularly on those issues that were identified in the 42A reports where uh, there were, was call for either more information, mm -hmm. more clarification, or there were uncertainties raised. And I've uh, set out in summary form those key issues uh, and what the applicant has done in light of those in terms of the various experts that have picked up and addressed in, our, in my submission fully those issues. And in an overall sense, uh, what the experts have done is gone back and looked at the application in light of the questions raised, uh, produced and framed their evidence to address those issues and where appropriate recommended further conditions of consent uh, which have flowed through into uh, offered conditions of consent. And uh, you'll be familiar because I know you've read the evidence that uh, Mr Dale, the Council's planner, is the last witness. Uh, he's our owner of the consents, he's formulated those in light of what's been recommended to him by other experts. So he has compiled those and attached them to his evidence. And I can say on behalf of the applicant, the applicant offers those conditions voluntarily uh, and is very happy to subject itself to all of those conditions on a voluntary basis. While I'm thinking about conditions, one thing I do want to alert you to as you hear the evidence and the case develops is that uh, Mr Dale will recommend uh, additions to the conditions that you haven't yet seen and they relate to the issue that was raised by one of the submitters experts about the prospect of MFE guidelines for waste acceptance being updated over time and that's an issue that the applicants team has reflected on and considers a, a perfectly uh, appropriate and good suggestion that the expert uh, will, has recommended to Mr Dale who's then reformulated conditions. So uh, I can just signal to you that conditions 93 to 96 <coughs> and condition 113 uh, will be recommended by Mr Dale to be amended to enable the conditions to uh, evolve should MFE guidelines be produced that change the recommended acceptance criteria for a class one landfill <coughs> uh, so that the acceptance criteria aren't locked in time if there are new or developing recommendations out of central government for New Zealand landfills uh, as a matter of good practice the applicant is very happy to uh, accept and volunteer that it complies with whatever the current guidelines prescribe. One other key issue that uh, I'd like to address you on is the issue of receipt of putrescible waste into the landfill and um, this arises subsequent to the application being lodged in the sense that the Dunedin City Council has uh, continued to implement its Waste Futures program and one of the key aspects of that is that it has decided to uh, fund and proceed with a range of uh, waste collection and treatment um, facilities and programs. Uh, these are detailed in Ms Graham's evidence and that of Mr Henderson, but in summary it, it is to separate at the curbside with a 4 plus 1 bin system uh, the municipal waste and that is then uh, alongside education of consumers intended to be able to manage better their different waste streams and the consequence of that is that uh, the council has also uh, funded and committed to a, um, a recycling and uh, treatment or, or, or separation facility uh, where the waste is received and uh, separated into its various streams. 
uh, key amongst that is separating food and green waste for further processing, uh, separating uh, recyclables and then looking to dispose to landfill of the remaining waste. And uh, part of the key decisions that the council has uh, made enables the update to the conditions that you will have seen in terms of this particular application at Smooth Hill that uh, the putrescible component of the waste stream is intended to be diverted and only uh, material that is either uh, identified as contaminated or for some other reason can't be recycled is to be treated as special waste and disposed at Smooth Hill in accordance with the procedures set out in the back of the conditions, Annexia 3, uh, that Mr Henderson can speak to. Uh, that has a special uh, procedure for pre-booking uh, the waste of that type, uh, immediate disposal to uh, a pit and immediate cover. The, the intention being that the normal uh, waste going to landfill is non-putrescible uh, to the extent that that's practicable and the contaminated putrescible is treated as, a, as I've said as special waste and treated sensitively and immediately covered as a uh, key method to manage the risk of birds. So that's an important <coughs> development um, and it's in the evidence. It wasn't addressed in the original application because those uh, decisions all evolved subsequent to the lodgement. Um, the application has a range of positive effects and I've outlined and summarised those in my submissions, paragraph 84 and subsequent. Uh, you'll hear from The Economist, there's economic benefits uh, which are in my submission substantial. But also the major benefit is that it enables the Dunedin City Council on behalf of the citizens of Dunedin to run a, a modern, uh, specially designed landfill for the, the waste that the city does continue to produce uh, in a way that uh, it considers is appropriate uh, and that's one of the key benefits that this proposal brings uh, for the city. I've summarised the overall effects in Paris 91 through 95 and I of course rely on the experts. This is, I only make submissions on the law and can summarise what the experts have said and you'll need to hear them and, and hear what they have to say in answer to your questions. But overall, it's my submission based on the evidence as it is currently that the adverse effects on the environment are classified as minor and acceptable by Mr Dale and he's drawn on all the range of other experts that uh, you've, you've read. For a new landfill of this scale, that is, in my submission, um, a very good position to be in, in the sense that the uh, landfill is of a scale to accommodate the type and volume of waste in the location that it is proposed and it's my submission it's important that uh, you consider carefully the evidence of those experts and note that that's the, the level of effects beyond the boundary of this property. I want to talk to you about uh, the risk of bird strike and this is a key issue as I've already said in my submissions. Um, the applicant has fully grasped the nettle on this issue in the sense that it is a key issue. It's been an intense focus of the applicant. Uh, you have read the evidence of Mr Philip Shaw who, will, who is here and can answer any questions about that. Um, the applicant, as I've said in my submissions, has uh, consulted him as an international expert on this particular issue and has taken on board all of his recommendations and designed its application around uh, the recommendations he has put forward to manage the risk of 
uh, birds being attracted to this landfill. Uh, and just to, to reiterate and, and reinforce what is being done, because it is an important issue, and this is not a, a, a single approach. The approach that Mr Shaw has recommended is, firstly, it's an area-wide issue. It, it, this is not just Smooth Hill within the bounds of the site. So uh, bird risk exists today. Uh, there are birds across the Tyree and elsewhere. And so one of the um, issues that Mr Shaw has recommended is that the uh, number of birds currently operating at Green Island should be addressed prior to that landfill closing and the city operating Smooth Hill. Uh, that is clearly a focus because significant gains can be achieved in managing the bird population, particularly black backed gulls, uh, that are currently operating at Green Island prior to that closure so that those birds don't become dispersed looking for other habitat, particularly Smooth Hill or elsewhere near the airport. So that's the first limb. The second is looking uh, also at the airport site and working with the airport and other sites around to manage populations uh, to ensure that uh, there is no increased bird population residing or, or travelling near the airport. And the, the third limb is at Smooth Hill itself and the key aspect there is that the applicant is committed to ensure that bird populations do not establish and that is the primary focus. Uh, Mr Shaw has recommended a range of escalating uh, interventions on site to ensure that that's not the case. The conditions uh, that you will have seen are onerous. They require that birds are managed to zero densities above 50 grams every day. That is no birds. And if they arrive, there is escalating steps in that plan to uh, remove birds from the site, including, unfortunately, lethal methods, but that is important to, to if birds arrive, they need to be attended to. Uh, but also escalating through a range of steps, such as uh, wires, baling waste, and the ultimate uh, protection is to net the operating landfill face, should 12 breaches of the standards that Mr Shaw has recommended in a calendar year occur. Now, if things don't go well, that could happen quite quickly. We don't think it'll ever get there, but in the event that things don't go well, then the landfill face must be netted. Uh, and that's an obligation that the applicant doesn't uh, look at lightly, but it has, as I've already said, volunteered to do that. Uh, to ensure that it takes all steps to manage and avoid the risk of increasing the risk of bird strike to the aviation industry. So in my submission, uh, you can be assured that the applicant is committed and has done all it can based on the best evidence it has to manage that potential risk. Uh, and in my submission, the thresholds set out in the regional planning document to protect the airport from incompatible uses is well met, uh, which in my submission is the appropriate test. The other thing I should say on that issue uh, before I move on is that the applicant has worked uh, in detail with the airport and you've probably seen that in the evidence and one of the other limbs to the conditions that is volunteered is to um, have the airport representatives participating in an operational group as part of the landfill operation and to provide the airport the ability to escalate or to, to uh, recommend escalating the steps through that uh, plan of Mr Shaw despite the thresholds not being met, so that if there is a particular concern raised for some reason, uh, the airport is engaged and able in conjunction with the consent holder and the operator to escalate those steps before the thresholds that are set out by Mr Shaw are met. 
Uh, that goes beyond what Mr Shaw recommended, but the applicant is happy to do so through working with the airport. Um, I've set out in my written submissions uh, some case law and submissions relating to such topics as um, perceived risks, effects on property values. Uh, I don't propose to read those through. I, I, I've set them out with citations there. Um, I think those principles should guide your decision making. I'm happy to answer questions about those if there are any. Um, the other topic I've addressed and the evidence has addressed in quite some detail, which I do want to stress, is the assessment of alternatives. Uh, and there's been quite some evidence about this. And it is an important issue and it is in the frame that you need to consider. But my submission on that is that it's not for you uh, to choose the best site for a landfill for the city. Uh, what you need to be satisfied of is that the applicant has gone through a sensible and appropriate site selection exercise and it has properly looked at alternatives available. Uh, and in my submission, the application, the evidence, all points clearly to a conclusion that that has been done. There, there are a range of alternatives that have been highlighted in the evidence that the city has investigated uh, and for the reasons expressed by the council officers uh, the Smooth Hill site has still been favoured for the reasons that have been provided. Um, in my submission that is clear evidence that a detailed and appropriate site selection assessment has occurred uh, to ultimately prefer this site over a range of other alternatives, including such things as incineration, out-of-district options, and expanding the footprint at Green Island, are the principal ones in the mix in the last few years. I wanted to move then to some comments about the conditions and I had various points I've already made in writing following paragraph 125. Um, hopefully they're clearly set out and I'll just quickly whip through those just to reinforce that uh, a 10 year lapse date has been sought for the application. I know Ms Lennox in her report um, said that wasn't the case, but I'm sure <coughs> she's able to update that. Um, in terms of the terms of consents, you will note that um, 35 years is sought for the land use and discharge consents and a six year term for the take of groundwater to align that to the Plan Change 7 recently adopted by the Environment Court. As I've said, Six years isn't very long, but the applicant, in light of the directive policy, is prepared to wear that risk and promote the application on that basis. In terms of the conditions, I've, I've already explained they're attached to Mr Dale's evidence in terms of draft conditions for the ORC and the DCC consents. Uh, the applicant uh, isn't fixed in its view on those. They are a work in progress. Uh, they are offered and will continue to be offered as, well, as long as I have instructions that that's the case. Um, the team are here to answer questions and Mr Dale, as our planner, will be listening carefully. He'll be in attendance and whether they evolve further, uh, obviously he, he will get his opportunity to address you on those and uh, as I've said in my submission, uh, we're open to appropriate changes uh, to ensure that this application uh, works and can be actually implemented. Um, I briefly said in terms of part two, I really think you've got a, a lot of policy framework in front of you. I don't think part two will necessarily assist you. Um, and I make the submission that you don't need to have recourse to part two. 
Um, before I conclude, I do want to address you now on uh, submissions that have been made by my learned friend, Mr Page, on behalf of the airport. Uh, he pre-circulated his submissions and I'm grateful for that. And there is one legal issue I want to address you on now uh, so that I don't have to await the reply at the end of this case because I don't want it in your mind. So I, I want to address you on that now. And can you <coughs> hand up that designation? Ms Kindiak will just hand up a document which I want to talk to you about and that arises from Mr Page's submissions. The issue is that Mr Page, on behalf of Dunedin International Airport Limited, has made the submission that uh, the airport operates under a designation in the district plan and that the Smooth Hill landfill uh, also has a designation. And he's made the submission that uh, the airport conical flight fan protection rules in the designation uh, may well apply to overflying blackback gulls uh, and suggests in his submission that therefore uh, prior approval of the airport is required and hasn't been sought nor obtained. Uh, that, that's the issue I want to address you on and what I've handed up to you is the uh, designation for the airport. Uh, it authorises the airport but also provides restrictions on other uses of land in the vicinity of the airport. And I draw to your attention condition 11, which is the one I want to highlight to you. This condition 11 addresses the height controls that arise from the uh, designation. This imposes restrictions on other users of land to protect the airport. The important point there is that the obligation on other <coughs> landowners it applies to those carrying out works involving establishing forestry, any structure which includes a building, aerial, antennae or other object on land, and the obligation is to, in para 11c, to obtain the written approval of Dunedin International Airport Limited if the surfaces specified in the designation will be penetrated in any way. It's my submission that the surface penetration rules clearly apply to structures, buildings, aerials, antennae or other objects on land that penetrate the flight protection surfaces. Now that makes perfect sense because it's those objects, structures and the like that obviously could interfere with the overflowing aircraft. Uh, there is nothing in the designation at all that applies to such things as birds overflying people's properties. And my submission simply is that uh, the designation does not restrict anything other than structures, buildings and the like set out in condition 11. That's the operative obligation on landowners. Uh, and to think of it in practical terms, if Mr Page was right, every landowner essentially on the Tyree who is owning or occupying property under that conical flight fan who has a bird flying over the property would also need the approval of the airport, which is clearly a nonsense. So I just want to make that submission because it's not accepted that uh, Mr Page's submission uh, has substance when the actual content of the designation is analysed. And I do note that he's referred to civil aviation circulars uh, in support of his argument, but not in fact the condition 11 of the designation itself. And I think that's an important uh, component to that argument. So in my submission, uh, birds, whether they fly over Smooth Hill or any other property, just aren't captured by that designation.
So in conclusion, it's my submission to you that the applicant has designed an excellent landfill on this site. The site is well suited to a landfill and it has engaged a range of uh, very experienced independent professional advisors to shape and design this landfill and to assess its environmental effects, both positive and adverse. Uh, you'll hear from them today and days following. Uh, and I ask that you uh, question them carefully and listen to what they have to say. Uh, and overall, it's my submission that you should feel entirely confident that this is an appropriate site to grant the necessary consents to enable the applicant to uh, give effect to this landfill for the benefit of the citizens of Dunedin. So those are the matters I wanted to address you on. Uh, I'm obviously happy to answer any questions that you have. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr Garbett, for that um, summary of the legal submissions. Just before I see if my colleagues have questions for you, I just want to talk to you about conditions. Yes. Um, as you've referred to, it's important for us uh, in terms of assessing the applications to be confident that uh, a suite of conditions that are clear, certain, practical and enforceable can be imposed that would deal with any potential adverse effects yes. consistent with the directions of the statutory instruments. I've been through the conditions that were attached to Mr Dale's evidence and um, both in relation to the land use consent required from the City Council and the consents required from the Regional Council and I have about 120 uh, queries or questions relating to those conditions. In terms of those four matters I, I outlined, clarity, certainty, practicality and forcibility. So I've been thinking how best I can convey that to yourself and the other participants in the hearing including the 42A reporting officers. And having discussed it with my colleagues what I intend to do is this. I will take Mr Dale's um, recommended conditions that were attached to his evidence, which were in track changes format, and that was very helpful, so thank you for doing that. I'll then accept all of those changes solely for the purpose of the exercise I'm about yes. to explain, and I'll then annotate those conditions with comment boxes in which I pose uh, my questions or raise a query so that um, your experts and Mr Dale and the 42A officers and other participants can think about those questions. And then perhaps um, when we hear from Mr Dale, uh, he can then, if he doesn't understand any of my comments or queries, which might be in shorthand format, yes. he can then ask me so that he's clear what my concerns are and any other concerns that my colleagues have. And then perhaps in consultation with the 42A officers as part of your reply, you may wish to come back to us yes. and address those concerns. So I just wanted to float that with you and ask if that would be an acceptable process from your perspective. Yes, I think that's perfectly appropriate. Um, I know Mr Dale has a clean version of the conditions that he was having sitting with him for the purpose of this hearing too, so he could perhaps provide that to you. That's, I've already that's, clicked, oh, you've clicked got it, accepted yeah. and yep. stopped tracking on the versions. Yep, no, that that's fine. Them. That sounds perfectly appropriate. I don't think there's any concerns whatsoever with that. Thank okay. you. And just checking with the 42 officers, are you happy for that kind of process? Good, so there'll be a bit of homework for you to do over the next few days. Um, just in terms of that, um, they were matters of detail. I do have four kind of general concerns about the conditions. And just to reinforce to all the participants who are in the room and who may be watching on Zoom, that doesn't mean that we're predetermined in any way. We just need to be sure that we can impose conditions that would meet the matters that I outlined. And part of our assessment process is making sure that is the case. So I've got four general issues that I just float with you at this stage. The first one relates to scope, the scope with which we have and the jurisdiction that we have to impose conditions. Um, in my experience, we're in a reasonably unique position in this region and that under the regional plans, uh, there's no trigger for earthworks consents or vegetation removal consents. They're only triggered in this case by the NES fresh water and that's only in relation to effects on natural wetlands, if any. So we have quite limited scope, in my view, to impose conditions on the ORC consents that relate to earthworks or vegetation removal or the effects thereof. And uh, part of that issue, of course, is the site is already designated. Um, and so the other concern I have is that um, it appears to me on first reading that some of the conditions that are recommended to us, particularly for the ORC consents, would be better contained in the outline plan that the, that the applicant must 
lodge under 176A of the RMA unless it's decided to waive that. Mm. So that's just one general concern. Uh, the second general concern I have is the proposal to establish a peer review panel, which I don't have a concern with a peer review panel. That's a very common approach for major infrastructural projects such as this. The concern I have is to then assume that the peer review panel should undertake a certification role, be it for management plans or other conditions. In my view, that certification role must remain with the regulatory authority, which is the OIC in this case. Uh, it would be highly appropriate for a peer review panel to recommend to the OIC that things should be certified or not, but I'm not persuaded that it's appropriate to delegate that role or assign it to the peer review panel, because they're not the regulatory authority. The third concern I have in general terms relates to the use of management plans, and again there's no problem with management plans, um, they're a very common approach. Um, however, there are a number of requirements for management plans that need to be met, and we're all, the th panel, the three of us are very experienced in dealing with major infrastructural projects and the use of management plans. Uh, the first matter is that any limits, standards or requirements should be in the conditions, not in the management plan uh, description of contents. Management plans are more about the detail of how conditions will be complied with, rather than imposing limits, standards or outcomes. Uh, so management plans are more of a process rather than an outcome. And there are certain requirements that conditions relating to management plans should address. Uh, they should have a succinct objective. Uh, they should specify which conditions they're designed to assist with complying with or implementing. Now they should specify the minimum contents of the management plan. They should specify who is to prepare the management plan. And they should specify who else might be involved in that process or consulted with as part of that preparation. And in terms of management plans, generally I think there should be specified in conditions a detailed certification process. Uh, and that should deal with time frames, what would happen if upon receipt of a draft management plan, the council decides not to certify it and they refer it back to the applicant for further work. Uh, that process should be detailed in conditions. And then there needs to be a process for varying and recertifying the management plans, especially for long duration concerns such as this. I'm not confident all those matters have been dealt with in the conditions that are currently before us. And my fourth general concern is that obviously we can't condition third parties to do things whether it be the need an international airport or the peer review panel or any other party, we can only condition the applicant to do things. The applicant can then commission or request or ask other people to do things, but we can't condition third parties. So there are four general concerns that underlie a lot of the detailed questions that I'll document in my little comment boxes that I referred to earlier. But I just wanted to uh, let you know now and let all the participants know that they are the general concerns I have that will underlie a lot of my questions or queries. And I don't need you to respond to that now, I just wanted to let you know that as a matter of fairness at this stage of the hearing that that's where my thinking currently sits. Yep. I do want to respond, thank, thank you for that, it's much appreciated I'm sure um, the team are considering those matters in detail. Uh, one thing I would like to just respond and sort of put the applicants view of things in terms of the peer review panel comment about the certification role. Um, I absolutely hear you on that and, and this condition has been recommended by OIC staff that the applicant have picked up and, and our clear understanding is that the, um, the, the peer review panel has a range of tasks set out in the condition and it was designed to certify that the plans or whatever the applicant had produced in terms of detailed design and so on was certified by it to meet the conditions of consent but that certification was of the peer review panel itself that was then provided to the ORC to consider the position independently as regulator so it wasn't ever seen that the peer review panel uh, effectively uh, substituted the role of the regulator in any way it was just and whether the language is, is, yeah. could be better used by saying that the peer review panel will 
uh, recommend that the uh, whatever it is, the detailed design plans or whatever, achieve the conditions it is what was intended. Uh, and there was some note in the condition that uh, this didn't bind in any way the OIC as regulator. So uh, we're certainly alive to the issue that you raised and, and didn't think we had trans transgressed there, but maybe that the certification language yeah. might have caused you to consider that. Yeah, no, thank you for that, and it certainly yeah. aligns with my thinking on, yeah. on how conditions of that nature should be worded. Yeah. No, thank you. Now, I'll just see if my um, colleagues have any questions arising from the legal submissions. Do you have any questions? Yes, I've got um, a few questions, and I'll just pick up on that last point first. Um, I was going to leave this to the last question I had, but I'll start there. Um, I've worked on a number of landfill proposals through the country, over the last 25 years, so I'm quite familiar with all of the consents for particularly Hampton Downs, Cape Valley, Dome Valley, which was processed uh, last year, AB Lime that has gone through um, the last year, um, and um, Bonnie Glen and the Manawatu are particularly uh, things I'm in, uh, quite intimately involved with, not AB Lime, but the others. So when I looked at Mr Dale's conditions, um, the thing that really stood out to me is that they didn't seem to bear much resemblance to other condition sets that have been through the Environment Court in particular um, and the way that they're structured. So I think nearly all of those conditions that I've just referred to have, for example, a set of general conditions where, uh, and I'll use, use this example as I'm going to raise it with some of your witnesses, where you would state... Um, uh, something like the size or the area of the working face at the landfill. Um, that, at the moment, is sitting in your landfill fire risk category, but actually it relates also to things like odour control. So it needs to be... Something like that should be sitting in a general set. And then the various consents have their own set of conditions. So you might have discharge to land, discharge of solid waste to land, discharge of leachate, stormwater. They get separated up that way, so the conditions only apply to that particular consent. Some of them even have different terms on them. But that's the structure I'm more familiar with, and I just wasn't sure if your team had started with that approach or just started with a set. Yeah. What was the, how did you do it? Um, so the team certainly looked at Cape Valley, AB Lyme and, and any others that were around and, and tested themselves on those. Um, I suppose that's a question for Mr Dale in terms of how he's developed up, but I know that the, the development process was informed by all the relevant experts who fed in, like mm. the example that you've given in terms of fire, the, the expert made a recommendation that then Mr Dale then picked up and, and kept in the a suite to manage that yeah. risk. So that's probably been uh, checked against the condition suites that are out there in terms of content and obligations and so on, but probably built up here by the independent recommendations that have been fed through to Mr Dale and mm. structured in that manner. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll go back to the first question I have. Yeah, now. thank you. Um, so this is referring to uh, your... Your opening section, your project overview yes. of your submissions. Thank you. And where you've referred us in paragraph five to um, Smooth Hill and what it's going to be, but also uh, what's been going on at Green Island. I think I read somewhere that the Green Island consents expire in 2023, is that right? Yes. Which is next year now. Um, October next year. Yes. October next year? Okay. So what process is the council doing to extend those? I mean, I'm, because I've also read in your evidence that it's going to take two or three construction seasons to get Smooth Hill ready if yep. you were granted consent. Yep. So what's going on there? Yeah, so the, uh, the short answer is that council investigating uh, the option of uh, extending the current discharge consents at Green Island. Uh, mm. There's work going on to look at that. There is uh, currently void potentially available at Green Island uh, within the currently consented, I suppose, maximum limit, as well as the possibility of extending that uh, current uh, cap limit. So uh, 
any decision on that hasn't been made by council. They're certainly investigating the uh, options of extending the term of the discharge consents at Green Island uh, and investigation work is ongoing at the moment and any consent would obviously uh, preferably be lodged <coughs> early next year uh, prior to the lapse of those consents in October, yeah. October um, of next year. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because there's a bit of a process to obviously get to that point. Yes, that's right. Um, and that, if that was proceeded with, I'm taking from your mention of the void, that you wouldn't be interfering with the area that's been mentioned as the reason for not extending Green Island. Yes, so yeah. what I'm talking about there and that, that answer is um, increasing or, or applying to extend the term of the consents on the current operating footprint mm. and uh, I'm not aware of any work that is looking to extend the footprint into that area that has been effectively ruled out for the reasons set out in evidence. Yep. Okay. I was uh, just turning now to your paragraph 23. I just was somewhat intrigued by the overlap of the dates here. The fact the applications went in basically a week before the mm. um, NES fresh water came out. And as we've now discovered through the various Section 92 requests and all sorts of things, there was quite a bit missing at the start. Was the council aware that it was coming and that it was going to make a problem for your landfill as you proposed it then? And it was lodged ahead of that? Um, probably the, the, the truthful answer to that is that a lot of work was going on to lodge the application in that year. Mm. Uh, then uh, we had the NES came out, I think, a month before it became operative. So the council was well alerted to the fact that when the NES was promulgated, with uh, I think it had a month till it was to be effective on the 3rd of September, mm. and decided that it uh, was in its interest to lodge the application prior to that date. Uh, particularly to uh, preserve the activity status of discretionary that y y you're now considering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, paragraph 33C. Uh, this is a point that I think Mr Page made in his submissions the other day. Yes. And I just wanted to ask you uh, what your response to it is rather than waiting for your reply. Um, it's, there's lots of different ways of interpreting this. Perhaps Mr Page has interpreted it one way and you seem to be taking it in a different direction, but this, this is the question. Do you interpret the any possible alternative methods of discharge, including discharge into any other receiving environment, as meaning it can be outside the district, inside the district? Um, it seems to be suggesting it can go somewhere else, but what's your interpretation? Yes, well, on the facts of this case, the applicant has certainly investigated out-of-district options in terms of cartage to other Class 1 landfills out-of-district. Mm. Um, so that has been done as a, in my submission, question of fact here. Um, whether the law specifically requires out-of-district options, my submission is it probably doesn't. I think you would be on safe ground as an applicant in my submission to assess in-district disposal options. Um, but I suppose my point here is well, the applicant hasn't confined itself because uh, it's taken the view there is no other Class 1 landfill currently in-district, so it has looked at options going outside the district. Mm. Right, moving right along, just a second. Just, uh, <clears throat> I think just um, just zoomed ahead to paragraph 73, and this is where you're talking about Mr Shaw. Yes. This is just a point, it's not really a question, but some of the concerns that I particularly have, but we have been discussing it as a panel, is whether Mr Shaw's recommendations have actually carried themselves forward into the conditions. Sure. Yep. Um, 
some of his evidence to me is inconsistent. He seems to be saying both avoid and minimise. <clears throat> And so, but the approach that the conditions take is to minimise, not avoid. So I'll be exploring that with him a little bit when he yes. has his turn. But um, while I think of it, one of the things you mentioned today was his last option of his sort of um, elevation of requirements, if you like. What would the council's position be on just putting the net up over the face to start with? Yes. Um, now, let me just t tell you why I've asked you yes. the question, perhaps. Some of the conditions that he has come up with and Mr Dale has included, so let's just talk about the zero bird um, mm. condition, for example. To me, having, unfortunately for me, spent quite a bit of time in my life sitting on landfill sites with clients and watching the tip face in operation and that sort of thing, um, just seemed very practical. Who's going to be doing this? Who's going to be counting these birds when there's all this other activity going on? Um, and needs to be obviously done very frequently. It just, it sort of seemed like it was an overstretch of, we can fix this, but it was, and I'm sure that someone can fix it, I just don't know that it would ever actually be carried out, mm. practically. You'd have to almost have somebody special on the landfill to do that every day. It gets busy with trucks coming and going and other and the things like, you know, notification of wastes and everyone having to deal with that. So I just wasn't sure quite how practical those steps were. Mm. But his final answer is, well, if everything else doesn't work, put the net up. So hence the question. Do yeah. you have an answer at the moment to that? Yes, I do. And I suppose there's two parts. I mean the obligation is on the applicant to uh, comply with the conditions with its operators and it, it would have a, a legal duty to manage the conditions uh, and resource that appropriately is the first part. In terms of the uh, possibility of netting from the outset, which is effectively mm. what you're asking, uh, it's certainly been considered um, and one of the or the, the direct answer to that question is the applicant doesn't consider it uh, necessary or appropriate based on Mr Shaw's advice that the risk can appropriately be managed in, in an escalating manner should, should the risk arise of birds actually establishing its site. Um, lethal methods, wires, bailing are all seen as uh, less costly but perfectly effective methods of managing the risk. Uh, the net option is uh, the ultimate way to, you know, obviously physically prevent any birds uh, from accessing the tip face at all. Um, and that is in the mix should the other methods, despite what Mr Shaw recommends, prove ineffective, which uh, you need to ask him mm. whether how he sees that being effective in operating, and we certainly have, mm. and I encourage you to do so. Um, so the, the short answer is it's not necessary to manage the risk. Uh, if it proved necessary, it is there and mandated in the conditions. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, now, so I just had a couple more things. You talked about the alternatives this morning and how you'd approached that with your legal submissions. Yes. How do you see that stacking up against the fact that the designation's been in place for, gosh, I think it was 1995 that was first mm. imposed, wasn't it? So quite some time. How do you align those two things? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I, I suppose in a... In a pure sense, the, the duty to assess alternatives arise from the discharge consent under 105 um, and I think that's an independent duty whether there's a designation in place or not actually. So uh, we, we don't see the designation answers that question uh, and there is an obligation uh, which as I've already said has been uh, exercised and fulfilled in terms of looking at those discharge options. Uh, the designation is a 
fact of this application in the sense that it is there and it absolves the applicant from needing to apply for land use consent and effectively sets the section 9.3 baseline under the DCC's jurisdiction of what can occur on site. But I don't go so far as, so it, it's, it's in the frame in terms of a factual matrix that you need to be aware that that is there and it does authorise the land use components of the landfill, but not the discharge, and it's the discharge that attracts the obligation to assess other discharge locations. Um, the other point that was that really stood out to me quite markedly from the conditions, but also just generally across the board with the evidence in your submissions, nobody's talked about a bond. I can't even think of a landfill I know in the past that does not have a bond, unless it was a particularly old one from the 1950s or something. Um, so I just want to put that on the table now, because that is really unusual. And while the council might have not thought of it because it intends to own the site and perhaps even operate the landfill, and I'll get into that with Mr yep. Henderson a bit, yep. um, there are some circumstances that have occurred, well, they're quite common these days, actually, but a particular circumstance I'm familiar with was in Auckland many years ago in the 1990s. The regional council owned the um, landfills that were operating around the city, so Rosedown and Greenmount particularly. Then involved a uh, local authority trading enterprise to get involved in that, and that late then became part of a partnership with Fulton Hogan, and Fulton Hogan then sold their interests and so on onto somebody else, and now uh, the company that sort of evolved from all of that enviro waste um, is now owned by Chinese. So over 25 odd years, that's what's happened there. Your landfill may well end up in a similar situation one day, who knows, um, in which case a bond particularly would be important, even if the council still owned the land, whoever's running the place might actually um, be a private company. And so I think you need to think through how a bond would work, whether mm. it's the council or not. Every landfill generally has a bond because it's there to remedy any problems at the site. Um, some landfill consents have a nominated sum, and I think AB Lyme has ended up with a close to a million dollar bond. Um, Hampton Downs has a sort of formulaic basis based on how many years and how much waste is in the landfill. Um, so there's different ways of approaching it, but um, I'd like you to give a bit of thought to that if you could, because nothing at all is very unusual. Mm. I don't know, did you actually think about that at all or not? Um, it's certainly been considered. That I suppose the, the proposition is, as you've rightly said, it's owned and consent applicant is the Tanan City Council as a public authority. And mm. um, while it's not shy in principle of a bond in the terms you describe, um, <coughs> putting up money from one public authority to another was probably seen as um, unnecessary. Mm. It's there as a protective mechanism. Yes, so I understand that something if ownership changes happens. down the line, it mm. provides the environment and the community that level of assurance. So yep. I, I understand Could the point. Just give a bit of thought to that. Yes, thank you. Maybe just read through some of those other consents, because they do all approach it slightly differently. Mm. Um, but, you know, as I said, it's very unusual to not have one at all. And that's all I had. Thank you very thank much. You. And just before I um, pass my colleague, just in terms of the bond, of course, it doesn't have to be a cash contribution. No. It can be an undertaking or an insurance yes. provision. Or you, it doesn't mean you transfer money from yep. one authority yep. to another necessarily at the outset. Uh, Rose, any questions arising from the legal submission? Mr. Garbutt, I have a couple of questions for you on the policy setting section of yes. your subs. So that's paragraph 105. Thank you. So I'm aware um, from reading the Section 42A reports and also some submissions that there's some key policies in the regional planning instruments, um, and in particular the partially operative regional policy statement. And I was interested in if you could talk me through the legal status of um, that document 
and in particular the policies 433 and 435. And um, I'm, I'm interested in your view on the legal weight that can be attributed to, to those policies. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so I, my understanding is that uh, policy 435 of the partially operative RPS is beyond challenge. Um, okay. That's my understanding. So w w we see no uh, okay. real question of weight well, a, in the sense that um, it's, the, it's, it's the operative guiding provision um, and it should be attributed material weight. Okay, and that, and that would be the same for 433? That's my understanding. Yep. The, the, okay. only, um, the only issue that I'm aware of that is effectively subject to challenge is the issue, I think Mr Dale addressed it in his evidence, about uh, whether the landfill itself is regionally significant infrastructure yes. in terms of the policy framework, yes. and there are submissions live on whether that is the case or not that haven't yet been determined. So the, the weight on you know, the uh, final makeup of a what is a regionally significant infrastructure is not yet being resolved. Certainly, thank you. Yeah. And um, following on, in terms of policy 435, um, yes. so there's a number of clauses in that policy. And I was interested in, in terms of the semantics and in the way that that policy is designed to function. Um, I guess your legal view on, on how those clauses work. Yes, thank you. I'll just grab that. Yes, so policy 435 deals with protecting infrastructure with national regional significance, the airport in this context. Um, there's a cascading range of subparagraphs in there, and the first one, uh, it's all under the um, chapeau of protect infrastructure. So it's the protect is the verb, which is important, but it sets out through A, B, C and D, how that's to be done. Firstly, A is restricting the establishment of activities that may result in reverse sensitivity effects. Now, my submission to you on that is that that doesn't really arise in the context of this application, because reverse sensitivity in the context of the airport would be dealing with things such as residents moving close to the airport, being concerned by noise and complaining about the airport. Uh, there's no suggestion that that's the case here, that the operation of Smooth Hill is going to some way complain about the operations of the airport and try and curtail their operations. That's just not, in my submission, relevant. Uh, subparagraph B is avoiding significant adverse effects on the functional needs of such infrastructure. That's clearly in the mix, and the question of whether bird strike uh, would be a significant effect uh, curtailing the functional needs of the airport. That's a relevant assessment. Uh, thirdly, avoiding remedy or mitigating other adverse effects on the functional needs of such infrastructure. So firstly, it's avoiding or otherwise avoiding remedy or mitigating, again, relevant to bird strike. And fourthly, which is probably the one I put most weight on, it's requiring protecting infrastructure corridors from activities that are incompatible with the anticipated effects of that infrastructure now and for the future. And why I say that's probably of most direct relevance is because uh, the issue of potential bird strike to aviation, uh, the question is whether the airport is being protected and whether the landfill in the form that it's promoted with all the conditions is incompatible. So that's the key one that I've stressed in my submission, is what I say is the, the relevant test. Okay, so in that sense you're saying that there's a, you've interpreted a, a hierarchy and in, in, in how the criteria should be applied in those clauses, or because they're, they're conjunctive, so they're all applicable, but you're, you're asserting that in this case the clause D is particularly relevant? They're conjunctive in the sense that they are all methods to achieve the chapeau of the policy. Some um, more relevant here than others is probably my point. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat>
no further questions from me. Um, we're scheduled to have morning tea at uh, ten thirty, but would it be convenient if we took a break now? We've had a reasonable um, question and answer session yes. from yourself, so maybe if we break now and then we can reconvene and commence with hearing from the witnesses. Is that acceptable? Thank Mr. you, Bert. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. <coughs> All right, and I'll just check how long we were going to break for. <coughs> 15 minutes, so we'll reconvene around about 10.25. Thank you.
hearing went to the All right, everyone, it's 10.25, so as indicated, we'll reconvene the hearing, and Mr Garvey, at this stage, we're hearing from your witnesses, and uh, just to repeat what I said earlier, I thank you very much to all the witnesses for providing your pre-circulated evidence, which we have carefully read in full. Thank you very much. First witness is Sandra Dawn Graham. <coughs> You confirm your name is Sandra Dawn Graham and you're the Chief Executive Officer of Dunedin City Council? Um, I can and I am. Thank you. Can you please answer any questions? The Commissioners have read your evidence. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you very much for that. Uh, good morning and welcome. So, Ros, any questions? No questions? Jen, any questions? Just got a couple of questions, thanks. Um, paragraph 22. I just note for the record yesterday that the government's climate plan included the food waste um, separation that the council is now promoting. Mm -hmm. But my question is actually um, regarding your subparagraph D, where you talk about a sufficient degree of control of both disposal and diversion facilities. Mm -hmm. Somewhere else in all of the paper that I've read in the last few weeks, um, and it is in some of the evidence, I think, there's been mention of a the possibility of a private contractor. And I didn't know if you were able to share any details about where that might be at. A private contractor in terms of um, uh, only operating the landfill? Yeah, well, it sounds owning. like, a, yes, yeah. something like that, or okay. a private partner or whatever. I mean, I realise some of these yep. things are commercially sensitive, no, so don't no, so feel like you need to answer it. But. my understanding, so I've been chief executive since October 2020, Mm. Um, but so, but from my understanding, there were discussions back in the early 2010s um, as a result, um, and it was referenced, I think, in one of the reports, and Mr Henderson may have more detail, but that um, suggestion has never been followed through with council, and um, there's no commercial sensitivity. This current council has no intention um, for anything other than public ownership of the landfill that's being developed. So it will own and operate itself? It will own and will contract someone to operate it on okay. our behalf. Um, I'll just, so this is the next question regarding paragraph 45. <coughs> which is really talking about the collection of food wastes mm -hmm. and separating things out, and, and I don't have any particular question about that for you. But I um, will raise it now so that Mr Henderson hears the question too and maybe um, can give some thought to it. One of the things that's arisen where I reside in Tauranga is we do already have our 4 plus 1 system underway. Mm -hmm. It started last year, I think. Um, and COVID brought us an unusual situation, and I don't know if any of you are aware of it, but you might want to think about it, if, uh, regardless of whether the, the landfill is consented or not. Um, when we were in the middle of the Omicron outbreak, because the food waste collections were so um, human intensive, someone has to get out of the truck, pick up the bin, chuck it in the truck, etc., get back in the truck, that's the way it works. No, no arm comes from the truck. That's just the way they do it. So the food doesn't go anywhere, I suppose. All of the food waste collection stopped for three months. And uh, all of the waste companies and people at the council were running out of staff, basically, to do the job anyway. But they had decided to separate that process out because I assume they thought it was putting staff at risk in some way. So the question really is, have you at all... Well, first of all, were you aware of that? But also, 
uh, what would that mean if it, something similar happened here? I mean, if I was thinking about this two years ago, I would never have thought that was even possible. But what happened was we were all instructed, in fact, by the council to put all of our food waste mm -hmm. into our red bin, as we have for general waste. Mm -hmm. So all of that was being carted off to landfill for three months. So, um, Commissioner, we have thought about that. Yeah. And uh, at the minute, we are, we've just finished the process, and Mr Henderson will be able to talk to this in more detail, of shortlisting and working with the um, companies who um, are going to get the contract for the curbside collection, and they have raised some alternatives to manage that exact issue. Oh, and okay. Mr Henderson will be able to talk about that at a high level um, right. when he gives his evidence. Great, thank you. Yes, caught us all out, I have to say. Um, that was really all I had in terms of my questions, thank you. And just two questions from me. Uh, your paragraph 37B, you addressed the Green Island landfill. And Mr Garbutt provided an answer to my colleague about that. Was there anything you wished to add to the, question, to the answer that he gave us about what might happen in, at Green Island in the near future? So we are actively progressing um, con consents to extend the life of Green Island on the existing footprint. And at this stage, do you have any um, idea of what kind of extended duration you'd be seeking? Mr Henderson will be Mr. able to Henderson answer that, can answer that. More, more accurately than me. I would be guessing from stuff he's told me. No, we don't want you to guess. So Mr yeah. Henderson, if you could answer that, that would be appreciated. And just one further matter that arises from your paragraph 79. You don't need to turn to that. But at that paragraph, you talk about working with local community members on major infrastructural projects that I'm familiar with, it's quite common for an applicant to volunteer the um, formation of a community liaison group, particularly where there's a large or widespread degree of community interest in the proposal, which I think it's fair to say is probably the case here. Mm -hmm. And then that community liaison group is established, it's administered and funded to a greater or lesser degree by the consent holder, and it provides uh, input can provide input to the development of relevant management plans and can receive annual reports. And it's just a nice way of um, providing that information out to the community. I don't think that's been proposed here. Was that considered and what would Council's um, view on that be? We absolutely considered it, but as I've said, we have an active community board in the area and you'll hear from them um, as submitters. At the same time, we don't want to presuppose that uh, an additional liaison group is what best meets the needs of that community. So while we're absolutely open to that as an option, we didn't want to predetermine an outcome that may not be what was in the best interests of that community. So we will work with the community, and it's we have multiple community boards that are so Mosgiotara Community Board, the Saddle Hill Community Board, and the wider community all have an interest in the range of submissions shows that. So we're more than happy to come up with something that works for the broader community. Thank you for that. So Mr Garbutt, maybe um, whoever it is appropriate in your team could consider the issue of a community liaison group. And perhaps just for our consideration, should we decide, having heard the evidence, that it is a good option, just to have some vision wording in front of us so that we yep. could use that as a starting point. Yep. Um, it doesn't mean that the track will go down, but it will help us decide if we should go down that track if we yep. have some wording to look at. Thank you. All done. And Ms Graham, thank you for your evidence. No further questions. No, I think I've already... Yeah, oh, I, sorry. I asked um, yeah. Ros first, yeah. Sorry about that, thank no, you. No, you should keep reminding me, because I do forget things occasionally. Oh, yeah, no, thank you. I think you, you're <laughs> free to go. Uh, next Thanks. witness is Mr Henderson. Good morning and welcome, Mr Henderson. Yeah, you, you confirm your full name is Christopher Brent Henderson. Yes, can you hold the confirm. position set out in your evidence in paragraph two. Group Manager, Waste and Environmental Solutions for the Needham City Council, yes. Thank you. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> what I ask permission for is that uh, the applicant's evidence was pre prepared and circulated, obviously. Uh, the submitters have then filed some evidence and raised some matters. That there are several of the witnesses I'll ask to comment in response because it's their only opportunity. So uh, several of them, if I ask an open question, to get them to respond to key issues that have been raised. 
uh, is preliminary so that you hear that and then we'll move to questions is my plan, if that's okay. No, that's absolutely good. I mean, anything really that will assist us and yes. provide us with useful information yes. is appreciated. Yep, thank you. And so that process you propose is good. Thank you for that. Yep. And perhaps um, even to assist us further, if, if that could then be documented. So perhaps if Mr Henderson is asked, answering open questions that you ask that are designed to assist us, if he could maybe then um, just write down the answers, yep. uh, maybe with a bit of context, and that can be part of the record. Thank you. Okay. And no. you don't need to um, get each witness, unless you really want to, to affirm who they no, are. No, yeah, that's fine. If you, if you want to do that, that's fine, but you don't need to do that. On no, okay, account. I appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr Henderson, you've read the evidence uh, that's being prepared in these proceedings by submitters. Uh, is there anything in your area of expert, uh, or your area as council manager that you wish to respond to? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Gavard. The... Um, uh, one of the things that came through in some of the submissions I read uh, was a uh, proposal for the concept of disposing different classes of wastes to different landfill facilities, both within and, within, uh, and outside of the Dunedin district. Um, so I just wanted to make it clear that Dunedin City Council has explored multiple options for waste disposal during our feasibility studies and as part of the business case process. Um, that has included options both within and outside of the Dunedin district um, and we have determined that those alternative options to, um, pose significant challenges and risks um, which includes export of waste out of the district being unacceptable to mana whenua. Um, in particular I wanted to raise the issue that some submitters appear to have assumed that it's uh, with the council commitment to uh, removing petrissable waste from the waste stream that that will make it possible for us to remove all of that type of waste from the waste stream. Um, achieving, despite our commitment to do as much as possible, achieving complete separation would require a screening process that basically is impossible to implement. Therefore, the residual general waste uh, produced despite our best efforts will still need disposal to a class one landfill facility. Um, and just to make it clear, there is a, uh, only a few of those in the Otago region um, and obviously a, a few outside of the Otago region, um, all or some distance away. Um, and just to reiterate the point that has been raised before as well uh, about an increase uh, extension at Green Island um, and there has been some submissions raised about extending or that it uh, should be relatively easy to extend the footprint of Green Island Landfill. Um, that has been thoroughly investigated. Um, there are some very serious engineering challenges uh, that would need to be overcome if we were to try and increase the footprint of the Green Island Landfill. Um, and so that, that expansion has basically been taken off the table <coughs> as quite impractical. Um, we also are aware that local Renanga are actually quite because of the location of Green Island, they are keen to see that closed um, sooner rather than later. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, and um, Ms Graham passed the question on to you, the extended duration in terms of time that you'd be looking to um, renew or extend the consents for it to Green Island? Uh, yeah, obviously there's a, um, I'm sure you're more than well aware there's a number of various factors involved in uh, how much life you can actually get out of um, a void space. Um, we believe that as of 2022, um, and especially with the additional waste minimisation measures that we're bringing in, we believe there's probably an additional six to eight years of life in what is currently consented. Um, uh, but that will obviously vary depending on the success of various measures and uh, anything else that may occur in this space from government intervention, etc. Yep. So, in terms of a more specific answer, when you come to um, apply to renew those consents for a limited duration of time, would you be looking at five years or six years, or what consent duration will you be seeking for that landfill? Um, yeah, that'd be a, that's a very interesting question. I would imagine that five to six years would be okay. um, my estimate at the moment, and just making sure that, that is, that's an estimate, yep. Yep, no, that's helpful, thank you. I'll just see if we have other questions for you. Jane, any questions for Mr Henderson? Yes, I have, thanks. <clears throat> um, first of all, and this is, a, uh, I briefly touched on this with um, Ms Graham, 
And this is regarding the um, private contractor sort of overlap. I'm um, taking it from her answer that you're the person at council that's responsible for setting up the contracts with collectors and all sorts of other people? Correct, yes. Um, so the answer she gave was that Dunedin City is proposing to own the site and so on and presumably then remain the consent holder, yeah. but the uh, private contracted collector um, would be doing their job and taking waste to the facility and somebody will be operating the facility for you. Um, is the collector and the contractor at site, is that proposed to be the same person? Or are you going to have a bunch of collectors? Or how is this going to work? Um, Maybe well, just walk me through what you're thinking of and then I don't have to keep asking you questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that hasn't, I mean, that has not been decided at the moment. We have already been to market for a partner for uh, curbside collections and resource recovery park to be established at Greenland Island Landfill. We're currently in negotiations with a preferred supplier. Uh, that contract does not include landfill operations. So that will be a separate uh, tendering process for operations and maintenance of a landfill when we get to that point. Okay. <coughs> it may or may not end up being the same contractor. Right. <coughs> oh, Scott, sorry. Um, you heard my question earlier about the bond, uh, and one of the reasons that I raised that was not just about the sort of private company eventually perhaps owning a landfill site, but for the council's point of view, um, where its own liabilities might sit with uh, being the owner of the site and the consent holder, but somebody else operating the landfill. Um, I'm aware of some instances in New Zealand where that hasn't always gone as happily as it might. Um, so I just wondered if you'd given any thought to that in terms of how those liabilities might actually be addressed in your contractual arrangements. At the end of the day, you're the consent holder if that's what you intend to be. Mm. <clears throat> but you've got somebody else often doing the actual work on the site. So just that, yeah. teasing that out a bit. Well, that's actually our current arrangement with Green Island Landfill. Uh, okay. The Land City Council own the site and we own the consents and waste management operate uh, that landfill on our behalf. So that, okay. is, that is actually yeah. our current arrangement. And do you know your issues, presumably, about that? Uh, no, no issues. Okay. Um, some of these things have already been asked, so I'll just... The Resource Recovery Park will be located where? Uh, Green Island Landfill has been... Uh, we already have a, uh, a half-established resource recovery area at Green Island Landfill with significant room for expansion. Um, as the council's waste management operational man, um, have you been the person at council, because you've actually been there, I think, for about four or five years, haven't you? Uh, four and a half years. Probably. Four and a half years. Have you been the person who's been working up the proposal with your team of experts, Mr Coombe and Co? Uh, on, on this year, yes, mm. I've been a um, uh, project owner, yes. Have you, I mean, so you've been quite involved in the design and that sort of thing and what the council was looking for? In the review of the designs, et cetera, yes, right. yeah, I have been. Okay. Uh, I think we've already had discussions this morning about conditions, so I'm not going to ask you anything about that. Um, It would be helpful to me, seeing you've mentioned separation of waste and practically how you would achieve zero or not, if you would just walk me through, and I'd like this for the benefit of the other parties as well, as to how this, how you propose this will happen. I mean, um, food waste, for example, being separated into bins means that that can quite easily be taken to another facility if it's in the bins already, but not everybody plays ball. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you get it to the transfer station, what happens then? Mm, um, 
Thank you, Commissioner. So as you mentioned, um, you mentioned Tauranga before. Um, I believe from the last update I had was Tauranga was getting about 50% participation mm. in that. <coughs> um, so the methodology is simply that we expect there to still be uh, contamination in the general waste. That general waste will be going to the bulk waste transfer station to be built at Green Island Landfill um, and emptied out onto the tipping floor before that is then consolidated into uh, trucks for transport to Smooth Hill. That gives us an opportunity to intercept um, any gross contamination that we can find in there. Obviously we won't be able to uh, get rid of all contamination but for argument's sake, if it's obvious that there is a significant amount of food contamination in a, a load that's just been deposited, mm -hmm. we can then quarantine that, you know, push it to one side for separate disposal uh, as, a, as in line with a special procedure. Um, that would be combined with rejected, because uh, even with people are using the food waste disposal, there may be materials that go in there which cannot be composted. Mm. So there will be some material that is rejected from the composting facility as well, which will follow the same procedure that quarantined and those quarantined loads uh, will be consolidated, treated as for special waste disposal. So what do you do for, you know, I mean, it, what it seems to be happening, um, even though our waste and tarong are separated out, is people are still using some form of rubbish bag in their, to put in their bin, so they don't uh -huh. just put all the waste in the bin. Um, in which case the food waste ends up in a bag in the bin. Uh -huh. Does that get picked up in the transfer station? Uh, through the... Uh, are you referring you know, to food the, waste or...? Food, well, food waste, protectable waste of some sort. Green waste tends mm. to not be such an issue, I've noticed, but... Mm. Um, if you end up with something in a bag inside a bin mm. uh, and it gets to the transfer station floor, that can be often quite significant if people aren't playing the game, if you like. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, so the, f the food waste itself will be going to a separate facility, the composting mm. facility, and the, the, the first stage of uh, when the material is dropped off there will be screening to try and remove things like plastic, etc. I won't go into it now, but there's some interesting evidence to say that most of the contamination actually comes from green waste, not food waste. Right. Uh, and do such. people mix those up, like put food waste and green waste? In yeah, the uh, it does okay. tend to happen, yeah. Um, there's also the probably slightly more problematic materials like uh, chemicals and sprays, etc., that come through in green waste, green waste which are more problematic. Um, but yes, uh, the, uh, that's one of the reasons that we've agreed with government proposals to not allow um, compostable bags to be used with food waste collections because that creates confusion for people about what is and what isn't a compostable bag. Then you end up encouraging plastic bags and that kind of collection. So um, it, yeah, I acknowledge it can be an issue, um, but it is, it is one that can, through education campaign and other things, you can try and limit that as best as possible mm. and screen for those kind of contaminants as your first stage. So we're, but getting back to the sort of the food waste has gone into what I call the red bin, the rubbish bin, mm -hmm. uh, and not the food waste bin. You take it to the transfer station floor. How do you then find it in there? Uh, well, normally the you squash it or what? Well, actually, I think that's um, uh, one thing that most people aren't fully aware of is a all recycling or rubber, um, general waste that goes into a truck on the curbside. Uh, of course, that's all compressed to mm -hmm. make sure that there's room in the, in the truck. Yeah. Um, so that's all squeezed in the truck and so plastic bags always burst. Uh, oh, I see. And right. So when it tips out, it's already When it tips out, it's already basically yeah. mixed. So right. uh, for one of it, if someone put a bag full of full of food waste in a general waste bin that is likely to actually contaminate the whole truckload. Uh, and if you can, if it's relatively easy to remove it and get uh, the worst of it and, and put that to composting, that can be achieved, um, but you're still going to have that residual contamination in the rest of the load. Okay. So do you then have a process if you end up, let's just say somebody's gone out hunting or a huge whanau have gone out hunting and all of the waste has ended up in the bin or fish waste or something like that, that's all because of that truck being contaminated going to go off to the landfill and do, would you then have a notification process for that? 
Yeah, the, uh, so we've included in that procedure that basically that would be treated as, as that special waste disposal. Yeah. So that would be uh, booked in and disposed of separate from just the general waste stream. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's all I've got because you've heard my other questions and uh, Mr Garbutt's answered some of the questions around the bond and so on, so I'll... Um, Leave it there, okay. Thank you. Right, any questions, Mr. Yep. Um, Mr. Anderson, no further questions from me, but just for the benefit of yourself and the other participants, so uh, in terms of the answers you gave to Mr. Garbutt's open questions, if you could put those in writing for us. But questions that we've asked you and you've answered, you don't need to do that because we've been taking our notes of our own questions. So. And, um, Mr. Garbutt, maybe if that could be, yes, maybe so if you could think about just when that might come to us. Yes, I think Mr. Henderson had bullet points, so if you can reflect on those, whether they're appropriate to give to the Commissioner and then provide them to the um, hearing administrator. Yeah, so that doesn't need to happen straight away, but just yeah. the next day or two or three, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right, thank so you. we can have the next witness now, thank you. Thank you. The next witness would be Mr. Ackhurst, and he should be online, so uh, we'll need to <coughs> test the uh, facilities here. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Mr. Ackhurst. Can you hear me okay? It's Michael Garbett speaking. Can we just test that sound? Just uh, stand by, we'll just test your sound. If you can introduce yourself and we'll make sure we can all hear you, please. Sure. Good morning, my name is Greg Ackhurst. I'm a uh, uh, Director of Market Economics and provided economic evidence um, on behalf of Dunedin City Council for Smooth Hill. Thank you, Mr. Eckes. We can hear you and we can see you fine. So uh, the commissioners have read your evidence. So can you please answer any questions they have for you? Cool. Uh, good morning and welcome, Mr. Eckes. Um, Rose, any questions? Good morning. Um, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm Rose Day, um, and I have a couple of questions for you. Sure. Um, so I'm interested in your response to some of the submissions that um, have been received. Uh, firstly, um, a submission at paragraph 81 in your evidence, you respond to Victoria Kahui. Yes, yes. Uh, so um, her concerns are around um, that the economic impact assessment does not follow the recently updated living standards. Yes. Um, you, you've set out a, a response there. Um, I was just interested in you, I, I guess, talking to that and teasing anything out for me. In particular, I note that a, another couple of the submissions raised the fact that there was no social impact assessment. So wondered if you could talk to that, please. Sure. Um, so my view of the uh, Living Standards Framework is that it is um, primarily designed to assist government departments in putting um, applications together to um, achieve funding uh, for different programs uh, and the, the process that they go through to do that requires them to incorporate I, I guess all aspects of the effects of that um, program that they're looking to obtain funding for uh, combine them into um, a consistent framework that would allow Treasury or, or, or whoever the funding agency is to make an informed decision having all of the information before them in terms of what, who's receiving the, the benefits, where the, what the costs are, who bears the costs, uh, and, the, and the full range of effects that, that would occur um, as a result of that, that program. So taking a step out of that sort of internal central government process into the RMA sphere, the RMA process and the consenting process effectively carries out that entirety of uh, assessment through different areas of expertise. So um, the environmental impact assessment is assessed using ecologists and environmental and um, experts, uh, noise, um, economics, um, uh, cultural aspects, social aspects, and, and so on are all uh, captured through the, through the different disciplines and that information is presented to commissioners or to um, a, um, a judge in the environment court and a fully formed decision um, can be made. Uh, so 
in that sense, my role in this hearing is really to understand the economic footprint um, associated with uh, the proposal that has come through the Dunedin's um, business case process and um, assessment of um, alternatives uh, and look to assess the um, economic effects of that proposal on, on the Dunedin, uh, Otago and New Zealand economies. So, so that's effectively why I, I, I don't think I need to bring into my assessment the um, uh, environmental effects and, um, and other effects that other experts are far more qualified than I am to, to put to you. Great, thank you. That's, that's really clear. Um, I also have another question um, in relation to Maria Seidor's submission um, in, para well, yeah. in, in paragraph 89. And it relates to the alternative sites um, process. Um, and your response um, was that when Dunedin City Council evaluated the alternatives, they were evaluated in cost-benefit terms. And I'm just wondering, um, just curious for my own knowledge, really, um, when you're doing your assessments, do you have, we, we, did you take the um, 1990s kind of co context and then reconsider those in today's terms? Sorry, I'm not quite sure I understand the, the 1990s context. Oh, um, so through the selection process um, with the um, alternative sites, so that's been since 1995 onwards, and you've mentioned there that um, those alternatives were evaluated in cost-benefit terms at that time. So I'm just wondering whether you've got any insight into whether those assessments are relevant to your report in today's terms. Um, so, so my understanding of the process that went before this hearing was that council evaluated a, a range of, of potential options um, um, in cost-benefit terms before they dis and, and I, I guess in, in a range of ways and, and they arrived uh, distilled from uh, 12 options down to three and, and down to the one that, that, is, that is before you today. So the, the information that went into those, that, uh, those evaluations has, a, I, I guess, a passing influence on my work, except that, I, I, I guess, only insofar as the distillation of the proposal that's before you and the costs associated with um, putting this proposal together have been distilled through that, that those sorts of processes. I haven't, I haven't, in my assessment, re-evaluated any of those previous proposals or any of those um, additional alternatives, although I was involved early on in looking at the differences um, between, say, trucking all of the, the waste to um, the AV Lime site in, in Southland as opposed to potentially um, depositing it at, at Smooth Hill. So I looked at some of the, um, the differences in costs associated with those two options, but that was really all. No, thank you. That's answered my question. Just wanted to clarify in my head um, the, the scope of your assessment today. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I've just got one question, and it uh, might sort of sound like a slightly unusual question, but I'll put it anyway. Let's see how we go. Um, the, the applicant now, um, since you did your economic assessment, is putting forward, in response to lots of matters raised by submitters and council officers, quite a, uh, an extensive set of conditions with lots of different monitoring requirements and all sorts of other things in sure. them. Um, and I have been sort of just pondering this, and I did it when we were out on the site yesterday. From its original proposal, the, the landfill was proposed to be about 44 hectares, and has now been reduced down to about 18 and a half hectares. And I just wondered if you had thought or been asked to look at some evaluation of the costs that come from the conditions versus what is now quite a small landfill site in the national context. Has anyone asked you to do that? So the, the costs associated um, with Smooth Hill have changed over time, and I have 
uh, had a number of different iterations of cost profiles, capital and operating cost profiles. Um, as far as I'm aware, the, the, the values that are in my assessment date from around May 2021, uh, maybe corrected by someone else in the team, um, and they are the costs that were associated with the, the final business case um, decision process that uh, Smooth Hill went through. <clears throat> if they have changed subsequently in a way that alters um, uh, the, either the capital or the operating costs, then that would need to be re-evaluated. Um, but as far as I'm, I'm aware, the, the costs that I've been given match the costs of the, of the, um, of the landfill as proposed. Okay, so have you ever, or have you seen the latest set of consent conditions? Uh, no, no, I have not. Okay. All right, that was all I had. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Akehurst. No further questions from me, but thank you for your evidence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Akehurst. Now, the next witness is Mr. Richard Combe. Good morning, Mr. Combe. You've seen how this operates. Yes. And um, in terms of your area of expertise, you've read the evidence that's been provided by some of the submitters' experts that particularly have commented on the design and the standards, etc. Are you able to address the commissioners on any issues that arise from that evidence within your area of expertise that you wanted to comment on? Yes, um, good morning everybody. Um, <clears throat> I've particularly uh, looked at the evidence produced by Mr Ife and Mr Rumsby. Um, my area of expertise is uh, landfill design um, and some of their comments relate to that. Um, I have prepared some uh, notes, uh, as we all have, uh, which I can furnish to you because there are some uh, diagrams that go with those that might help um, reinforce what I'm about to say, I guess. <clears throat> um, starting off with Mr Ife, um, Um, one of the things he's raising uh, is uh, that uh, the LURS in its natural state is not suitable uh, for the liner, and we recognise that um, uh, throughout uh, uh, Ms Webb's evidence and uh, as a geotechnical expert. Uh, modification of that LURS was proposed, and it is firmly within our proposal to do so. So we accept exactly what has been stated uh, in Mr Ice's evidence, but um, we, we agree with it and we're taking steps to to uh, um, deal with those issues, that the LURS is not, not suitable in its natural state. Um, and we believe it is, it is suitable in its modified state. Ms Webb will deal with that. I'm not going to talk about that process. Um, <clears throat> there was, uh, in Mr Ife's uh, evidence, he was talking about um, uh, the site selection process is 30 years old and the parameters are different to what the current selection process is. I uh, reviewed the, um, uh, the criteria that were used in that 1992 selection process, compared them against the, uh, the current uh, 2018 Weissman's um, uh, uh, set of criteria and they in fact are matching exactly. There was some suggestion that um, uh, the geotechnical uh, seismic aspect wasn't, wasn't addressed in the 1992 side of things and that um, there wasn't, that assessment was included in that 92 uh, assessment that was done. Um, there was uh, quite a lot of, um, from Mr Ife's evidence, quite a lot of uh, weight put on the Victorian Best Practice Environmental Management um, Guidelines for Landfills as being the appropriate standard that should be applied to uh, this landfill. <clears throat> of course, this is an Australian Victorian standard um, and um, says specifically in, in that standard that's developed for the Victorian, um, um, uh, Victorian area. Um, New Zealand has its own standard which is applied uh, 
uh, through all current designs of landfills uh, in, in New Zealand. Um, doesn't mean to say that uh, aspects of different uh, um, standards are not uh, assessed and, and used in part uh, um, within even the smooth hill design, but we did rely uh, on the, the current New Zealand best practice, which is the Weissman's um, uh, guidelines. Um, just a note on that, um, I did confer with one of the major authors of the, the guidelines as to the status of that um, uh, uh, set of guidelines. It's not draft, as stated by Mr. Mr. Eif. Um, uh, it's fair to say that the, way, that, uh, the Ministry of the Environment hasn't formally endorsed it, um, but it is used as uh, um, a best practice and is the basis of uh, landfill engineering design in New Zealand. Um, one thing I'd like to point out too is uh, there's been quite a lot of, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit more with Mr Rumsby's evidence, but um, the, the, the liner aspects and um, longevity, etc. Um, I'd like to point out that in, uh, in the set of drawings that were submitted, um, the base liner um, has a, a, a the, when I take the, say the base liner, I'm talking about the, the flat portion of the, of the liner as opposed to the one and four um, uh, inclined faces. So the base liner is the portion of the landfill that is more at risk than the side liners. It's, going to, it's the area that particularly where the sump is, where the leachate has been pumped from, will have more often than not more than 300 millimetres of, uh, of leachate within it. Um, and from time to time during extreme uh, rainfall events, uh, leachate will uh, well up within the waste and put additional uh, pressure, uh, pressure head on, the, on any uh, perforations or, or defects within the liner and result in um, increased um, uh, losses. Um, Mr. Kirk and, uh, is the and part of his help modelling has taken this into account. So the numbers that he has developed in terms of the expected amount of leachate losses uh, takes this into account. The point I'd like to make um, as part of the design is that um, uh, right from the outside outset uh, was my um, uh, my view, and it was it's been reflected in, in the design is that the baseline has an added level of protection associated with it. So um, the base liner is uh, shown on the drawings as 10 to the minus 9, 600 millimetres of compacted clay liner, uh, overlaid with a GCL, overlaid with a 1.5 millimetre um, uh, flex flexible membrane liner. Um, and in, in addition, in the sump that we talked about, that I talked about earlier, that is where the, the leachate pumps in, that will be regularly sub subjected to um, increased uh, pressure head uh, that the, the clay liner underneath that is actually one metre, as shown on the drawings. Um, <coughs> that's the points I'd like to make with Mr Ice's evidence. Um, Mr Rumsby. Um, <coughs> in my evidence, uh, I talk about, uh, and this is um, clause 70 of my evidence, I talk about the plastic H will reduce that, uh, that life of the plastic liner. Um, and they're the same issues that have been raised by Mr Rumsby in his evidence. Um, one of the significant ones, of course, is heat, which I'll address in a minute. Um, one thing I would like to say, though, is that um, we need to put into context uh, uh, the risk that we're looking at to try and mitigate with this liner. Excuse me, I'll just get some, some water. So um, the, what we're trying to do with the, with the liner is to stop leachate from getting out of the, they're talking about the base liner um, and the side liners as well, but the whole liner continuous, uh, to stop leachate leaking out into the environment. Um, <coughs> now, there are uh, numerous papers on, on the, um, the, the degradation effects of, uh, of municipal waste um, and how long that takes to, to, to stabilise, if you like. Um, and it's typically about 10 years that we get the, the, the waste to be reduced down to a point that it is far less, um, has a far less leachate or strong leachate potential um, than when it, was, when it was 
for that first 10 years is when you're going to get the strong leachate after that it diminishes. And um, the, uh, the, um, the uh, <coughs> I'm just trying to uh, quote a, a, it was a, um, oh, I've got it somewhere else, I'm sorry. Um, there's a, in the Victorian, uh, sorry, in the Ontario um, you know, Canadian regulations, they, um, they talk, no, there's, a, there's a graph that I'll submit to you, which is actually used in the closed landfill guidelines of New Zealand, which is the same graph. Um, it shows that by about year 60, uh, that that uh, waste is practically inert. So to put it into context, um, the landfill liner really needs to be uh, um, uh, intact and doing its function for a period of 60 years after the closure of the landfill. That's, that's, that's where we should be at. Um, the... the the plastic liners, uh, there, are, there are maybe about seven or eight different parameters that affect the, the longevity of the liner. <coughs> um, and heat being an important one because it actually affects the, um, the function of the, uh, for example, oxidation, uh, maybe due to chemical contact, uh, is um, exacerbated by heat. Um, so heat is an important point of that aspect, which Mr Rumsey points out, and we don't disagree with that. But I want to put into context as to where this heat is within a landfill. <clears throat> and I have some evidence that I'll present to you um, by way of graphs and a paper prepared by, um, it was by uh, Kumar and Kopp, which I'll, I will present to you, <clears throat> um, that shows that the, the centre of the landfill is where the, the large heat generation um, is, uh, occurs, um, partly because uh, there is, there's, more, there's more of a a loss of heat to the outside edges, being close to um, the natural ground, for one, um, and also that um, uh, the heat tends to build up in its in its mass. Of course, similar to the, your own body, your your inner core is is, is hotter than your extremities. <clears throat> um, the initiatives that are, that the council is proposing to remove the putrescible wastes um, actually remove some of the biological. Uh, degradate or the biological uh, mass that would contribute to that heat. So the more producible we take out of it, the less heat that is going to be um, uh, generated within that waste. Now, the magic question, there's two magic questions that come out of this. One is, what is the temperature of the landfill going to be? And another one is, how long is that liner going to last? Um, <clears throat> so uh, the evidence that I've... Um, you know, the Jafari and Stark uh, papers, which I'll refer to in my response to you formally, um, talk about um, the temperatures of being around about 35 to 40 degrees, or 35 to 45 degrees, which is, um, has been verified in, um, in various other papers. That's for a normal operating landfill, and we may well be less than that um, if we're taking out some of the putrescibles that were in present in the other studies that were done some years ago. Um, and the, uh, the Ontario Regulations 232-98, which is referred to in Mr Rumsey's evidence, suggests that um, the landfill liner, we're talking about the plastic liner, uh, the HDP liner is about 150 years. So putting that into context of where, you know, what is the, um, what is the risk, what is the period of risk and what is the longevity of the liner, um, my, my view is that uh, the... The liner needs to be in its best state early on in its life, and as it as it ages and degrades, which it does, nobody's saying it won't. Uh, we get to a point where the uh, the leachate becomes um, uh, uh, weaker, if you want to use it as a term, um, and has less effect on the on any discharge to the environment. Just like to reiterate, and it's in the plans and in my evidence, is that the leakage in a in, and a liner will be collected by the groundwater collection system, which will be monitored uh, in accordance with the conditions that have been proposed um, uh, and the consent conditions. Um, and if there is a problem with that material, that leachate will then get, uh, sorry, that groundwater that is contaminated with leachate will then be pumped back into the leachate system. Now, we need to put into context, is, is that going to be a big problem practically in terms of management of leachate? Um, are we now facing... Um, 
a very large amount of leachate that is going to be uh, difficult for the for the client to then or the, the consent holder to deal with. Um, so what in Anthony Kirk's evidence um, he talks about the um, at, at commencement the amount of groundwater that groundwater system is likely to uh, intercept is about 87 cubic metres per annum and that's reducing significantly as the um, the recharge area is being overlaid with a plastic lineup and has less recharge. But even at 87 cubic metres, uh, putting that into context with the 46,000 cubic metres of leachate per annum that are going to be removed off site, um, the 87 uh, cubic metres is, is extremely um, minor and have little effect on the truck numbers and all the rest of it that, that we need to deal with. Um, would just like to also say with regard to that, <coughs> we are putting a, a, a clay liner on the base of the of the liner. Um, there are uh, more historical now, but um, clay liners in themselves were the only were the primary um, form of leachate um, uh, uh, containment. Uh, we now have multiple layers for reasons that. Um, we now have a better we have a better system um, that we um, uh, we're dealing with, and I know that in Mr. Runsby's evidence he talks about um, problems with landfills like Greenmount and uh, others where the um, particularly the leachate systems have failed, and the uh, the leachate rises within the the landfills and then exacerbates the the head, etc. The point I'd like to make is th those are old landfills; they were. They, were, they are in a completely different uh, realm in terms of design, quality assurance, uh, maintenance than what we're dealing with here. Um, you know, we would like to think that at the end of this process, um, that this landfill being the, the most recent in, in New Zealand is the best practice in New Zealand and therefore um, that discussing old landfills and the problems they have, uh, in my view, is, is um, unnecessary clouding the, clouding the uh, the discussion. Um, Mr. Rumsby also talks about the leachate systems um, uh, and the failure of those. Um, there was a, in Tongan and Taylor's um, submissions uh, early on, they pointed out that the um, um, leachate uh, collection system, and I like to point out there are, as far as the pipe work that's in the landfill, there are two leachate pipe systems. There is a leachate collection system. Uh, which is associated with the 300 millimetres of um, drainage aggregate. Mm -hmm. that on top of that has a, a, a filter layer in the form of a, a geotextile. Um, and that perforated pipe then uh, collects the water that, uh, or the leachate that permeates down through the waste and takes it into this, into this leachate sump. In the leachate sump there is a separate system of pipes that has um, at the, the inclined rises, they're called in the drawings, uh, in which a, um, uh, a, a horizontal submersible pump is dropped down into the pipe to pump the leachate back out um, up to the leachate storage tanks for final disposal off site. Um, in the drawings, uh, the, um, the, the ability to flush those, that first set of drawings is actually included in the drawings, but it's not clear. Um, and I accept that's not clear, but they are definitely in there. And I've, in my main evidence, I've, I've told you that that is so, and it recognises that they're not clear. But I'd just like to refer to the, uh, the drawing uh, number, because I think it has... Um, uh, sorry. Drawing C402. Um, so in that drawing, um, and I can take a snapshot for you and put that in the in the response, just to assist. Um, does show that there is uh, there's one pipe in behind the other now for the purpose of, of running a jetting flushing system down through the um, not only the, the the riser pipes for the leachate pumps, but also for the um, uh, 
uh, the leachate collection pipes that run all the way back up the length of the landfill. Um, Mr Runsby discusses um, um, coal ash as being a means of clogging the leachate uh, collection pipe system. The layer that sits over the drainage layer is that if we do get any, uh, um, and we will get um, fines washing down through the waste, um, if we end up with an elevated uh, level of leachate within the waste, that doesn't affect discharge through the liner system. What we want to make sure is we're not putting pressure head on the, on the liner itself. So we could have a situation where we've got a, a, a perched leachate water table sitting above the, the filter layer, but as long as that drainage layer itself is, um, is not subjected to that head, the liner is not at risk in terms of increased uh, leachate flows. Um, so there, there is a, um, the management plan, and possibly this needs to go into consent condition, but the, the, uh, the, li the life of uh, the leachate collection system is directly related to how well it's maintained. So therefore the, um, the, the jetting of these leachate lines becomes um, um, completely necessary to, to make sure that we're going to achieve the, the life expectancy of the leachate collection system um, and the Ontario regulations, they talk about um, if we've got a leachate system that is not maintained, how long will it take before it gets clogged up, uh, as opposed to that that is maintained, and they've suggested in, in, their, um, uh, uh, in their regulations that a well-maintained system is, has a 100-year life expectancy associated with it. Um, I would also like to just point out in terms of the leachate system, the leachate system does include the, the um, 300 millimetre um, drainage aggregate that sits over the to top of the hole of the liner that is then protected by the filter system. I mean, putting that into context, we've got something like um, 30,000 square metres of base liner itself, uh, 300 millimetres deep, so we're talking about 10,000 cubic metres of drainage aggregate through which leachate can readily flow uh, should those pipes block. Um, stated in my main evidence, we've actually got two leachate pipes. Um, the leachate pipes are designed to um, take the worst case leachate flow, which is not the average flow. The worst case leachate flow is when uh, there's a piece of open liner that doesn't have any waste on it and therefore no attenuation. We get a rainfall event and there is a direct report within minutes of that water getting down into the leachate system and treated as leachate. And the pipes uh, for, the, for the large portion of it are, are designed to cope with that and I've discussed that um, uh, the pipes will handle a certain amount and when they don't, the drainage media itself will handle the rest. Um, I'd like to just point out that with the two-pipe system, if one of those pipes blocks, the, the leachate is going to want to go down through this perforated pipe, it's going to get to the blockage, whatever it might be, it's going to go out through the, um, the perforations in that pipe, it's going to continue down the 4% gradient on the baseliner until it gets to at some point that it's um, going to get past that blockage and get into the pipe. It would also get into the other pipe that's alongside that presumably is not blocked at that time. So the, having the two-pipe system provides another level of um, uh, uh, redundancy associated with the leachate collection system. Um, that was the, those were the points that I came from with regard to that evidence. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Coombs. And Mr. Garbett, that was quite a, a fulsome response to your open question, and um, that included repetition of the evidence that we've already received by way of summary, as well as responding to the evidence of the um, Bridget Irving's group of experts. Quite happy with that, because the liner, in this case, is a very important issue for us to understand. Um, but maybe just if you could just caution other witnesses to make sure we're not answering your open questions that don't repeat yes. material that's My already apologies. before us. Yep. Thank you. No need to apologise, it's, it's all part of the process. So we'll see if we have any further questions or if we have any questions for you, Mr. Jen, any questions for Mr. Coombe? I have. Um, when I first read your evidence, Mr. Coombe, I have to admit to a level of confusion 
to some extent with the original proposal that was tabled, well lodged with by the applicant, um, because your evidence is very firm on following the Wasteman Guidelines 2018, but it seemed to me that as it stood at that time, quite a few parts of it didn't. Wetlands were involved, um, you were near the airport, you seemed to have um, drinking water issues with the groundwater, and all of those things were in the guidelines as stated as not being appropriate for a landfill. So I went round that in quite some detail. It doesn't actually apply in all cases now because you've pulled the wetlands out of the mix. But have you got any comment on that? Because it, you're sort of really saying we worked very closely to achieve the guidelines and have the best practice, etc. But really, in some cases, there was a cross and not a tick. Indeed, um, my focus uh, has been the, um, the design of the landfill, more so than its uh, siting, to be fair. Um, and uh, the, the, the question about drinking water um, will be dealt with by, by other experts, so I'm, I won't uh, comment on that. Um, and uh, certainly, um, the definitions of wetlands, of course, have changed a little bit uh, from... from um, from previous, it's quite well defined now, and uh, certainly at the time that we were uh, looking at the original design, we were basically going to uh, retain the wetland but dam it off at the low end to, to, to create an attenuation basin within that. <coughs> um, so in, in short answer to your question, uh, Commissioner, is that um, I really focused on the, uh, on the uh, design of the physical works associated with the landfill and not the siting aspects of it. So did you, um, because I, I've already asked Mr Henderson and he's confirmed that he was involved as the sort of the client, if you like, with you and your team to work on the landfill project. Um, so you really started at, we're going to put a landfill here, design it. Is that seems to be what you're saying. Uh, well, we followed the, um, there was a previous done by, um, I don't know, forget the consultant, uh, not that long ago, uh, who did uh, a feasibility on the, on the landfill. Morrison Lowe, you mean? No, it wasn't Morrison Lowe. Stantec? Stantec, yes. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and um, we, uh, we uh, uh, well, I particularly adopted that as a starting point in terms of the design. Um, in fact, I had reduced the size um, uh, of the landfill from the Stantec design because um, uh, it, uh, it wasn't necessary, uh, basically. Um, and that was really the starting point where, where, I, where I came from. Right. Um, so did your design, so let's just start with your 44 hectares because that's where you yes. were, it's not where you are now, but what, what were they proposing? Uh, a lot similar, similar but bigger. Oh. Extended all the way down to the, um, uh, the, the there's a there's a connection there's a an angle of the designation where the stream runs through. It was pretty well running the um, uh, the landfill pretty much up to that point. Whereas I pulled it back in order to utilise um, um, a water quality basin associated with um, stormwater attenuation, which took up pretty much that uh, that wetland as we're referring to. Um, and um, that, and uh, and the, the, there was areas of the landfill that were not economic, um, so I, I pulled it back. Um, also made the the uh, downward face of the line of the capping steeper because they mm. had something like one and seven, and uh, in order to reduce that and keep the volume, we still kept the same volume. I'll point out, um, primarily I guess by uh, increasing that um, the downward slope. Um, okay, now there's been quite a bit of comment on seismic assessments and I think you just mentioned yourself today the, um, that there was some seismic assessment done for the 1992 process and I'm not going to go all the way back to there. But my question to you is, in your design, bearing in mind that I don't know that you had a detailed seismic ass assessment available to you, what were you basing your understanding of the seismic situation on? Uh, the seismic assessment would work by giving the um, ge geotechnical engineers and the geologists um, a basic design to start with for them to verify. Um, 
<coughs> they run it through a model, uh, computer model system, and they need parameters to put into that in order to come up with a, a, an answer. Um, I had a discussion with uh, the geotechnical engineers as what might be a reasonable slope in order just to a gut feel, if you like, to start off with, and that was that's then been verified through through detailed uh, analysis that um, as we will we'll talk about. Um, so the process was really starting off with something that sounded reasonable and then testing that against um, against the, the formal uh, formal models. Okay. As far as the proximity to the uh, to a fault is concerned, I didn't have any uh, any involvement in, in that decision making that was handled by um, uh, Ms. Webb and her, uh, her Sorry, team. handled by? Ms. Webb. Oh, OK, right. Yeah. Um, so you sort of had your, let's just say, sort of principled design or concept or whatever, yep. and then put it out to these teams of experts to comment on, to help you sort of just confirm whether that was going to be where you went or not? Is that what you that, said? That's right. I mean, my starting point, particularly on the sideliners, I mean, the baseline is practically flat for all intents and purposes. Mm. <coughs> the sideliners is um, it's a tricky one, and that we want it to be. I mean, we've we've had a fortunate site in that we can we've got a, a natural shape that approximates the liner um, gradient that I put in, and the liner gradient needs to be because we're putting a had to play clay liner down on there. We need to be able to compact that, so we can't come along and say, oh yes, I'd like to put it at. I mean, some landfills have one and three uh, liners, which they achieve, um, that's fine. We've got one in four. Um, we've got more chance of um, achieving our parameters associated with the compacted clay liner on that slope. That was my starting point, was one of practical um, uh, practical instruction, I guess, uh, and um, therefore likely surety of an outcome. Um, OK, so when I've sat in meetings with a number of experts um, with my own work that I do as a lawyer with landfills, it seemed they often have sort of started in a slightly reverse to that, where the first discussion is usually actually groundwater, and you kind of start at the bottom. What are the groundwater conditions like? You might have a valley. We've got a rough idea about this valley, and it might contain this volume, but the first sort of... Um, expert off the blocks, if you like, is the groundwater expert, because without that, nothing else can really happen until you know that that's able to be confirmed. The others might be doing a bit of sketching, but basically that's where it starts, and then geotech and so on all come in, and then you kind of end up at the top with the more land use experts coming in with their tuppence worth about trucks and noise and this and that. But you don't seem to have done that, and so you're sort of saying, you're, this was me, and then I called these people in this way. So they verified some technical matters for you. I, I you think, well, there was obviously with. discussions amongst all those experts. I mean, yeah. I worked very closely with, with mm. Mr. Um, mm. Kirk in the same office, and we've, we had all of those, uh, yeah. all of those discussions. Um, one of the things that was pointed out very early in the design process was the, uh, the LURS was not only... Um, uh, Dispersive, which makes it uh, a problem in terms of uh, liner material, and not only liner material. If we leave it there, there could be some sort of tomo associated with that, and that loose needed to be removed. <coughs> um, and uh, that was almost one of the starting points that I that I really started with, and taking that down to the the uh, the, the bridge here or the weathered bridge here in order to remove that problem in its entirety, which is the basis of that design. So, yeah, possibly it is being around uh, a different way, but there are reasons perhaps why that is so. OK. Let's just go to some of your evidence then, because that was more my sort of general intro to that. Um, first question is paragraph 24. Um, and we've touched on this already, but I haven't really asked this specific question yet, but let me ask it of you. This is where you're talking about keeping uncapped areas of waste as small as reasonably possible. Sorry, um, um, we're looking at my evidence. Uh, yeah, 29 paragraph of 24. Page, oh, 24, is the bigger part. Page 6. <coughs> so first sentence is what yes. I'm looking at. Yeah. Um, there's been quite a bit of chat about 
you know, whether there should be a condition about what is reasonably possible or whether there should be a prescribed area. Yes. I'm more familiar with the prescribed area. So we've had mentioned through the landfill fire experts of a 300, um, no less than, I think it was no more than 300, and, yes. and then a general mention of 1,000 square metres. I just wondered if you had an area that you would like to suggest as appropriate given the work you do. The 300 square metres uh, was a calculation that I did um, based on the average uh, uh, waste acceptance expected and a metre thickness of waste to be placed. Now, it was been recognised from the outset that uh, um, exposed waste is a hazard in a number of areas, and I won't go into that because it's pretty everybody else is talking about it. Um, 300 millimetres is a small, sorry, 300 square metres is a small area, practically, putting into context 30 metres by 10 or, or you know, 15, 16 by 16 or something like that. Mm. That is a small area, so the trucks are going to have to back up close to it and, and dispose of it, and that's been recognised. Um, in the fire uh, reports, they talk about um, typically 1,000 square metres, but 300 square metres if in fact there's a fire high fire risk. Um, <clears throat> we have had discussion um, with the client about what, what might be practical. Um, if, if, for example, the, um, the waste is, uh, for any particular reason, on that particular day, we need more than 300 square metres uh, in order to meet a, 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 a consent condition, we would have to cover part of that already filled area before we extended further on, which is completely uh, doable. I mean, the, the, it needs to be covered by the end of the day anyway. It just means they start a bit early in order to have this little 300 square metre slot, if you like, working its way mm. along. Mm. Um, I would like to... <laughs> I mean, the, the, the bigger the area from an operational point of, point of view, the better. The bigger area means more birds, more fire risk and, and all of that. The client can live with 300 square metres uh, on the basis that we would do as I suggest with a bit of a slot arrangement. Um, so, uh, look... Um, well, I'm, I'm raising it simply because of what the airport in particular have said, but other submitters have as well. Um, and if you leave words in a condition like as small as reasonably possible, for example, mm. practical... Could mean anything. It could yeah. mean anything. <coughs> and there will always be arguments with consent authorities about that, and you'll sort of, well, the applicant will say, well, that was as, as much as we could work with, and other people will say, well, yep. that's just far too big and there's too many birds. So it sort of seems to me to be better if there was to be a consent granted, that it would be specified as this, I, which I is agree. what I see more often than not. I agree completely. Yep. I think there should be a, there should be a limit on it. Um, uh, the client can live with 300, 300 square metres, um, on the basis that it, uh, you know, as I say, it doesn't mean that's the absolute for the day, it means that at any one time it's yeah. 300 square metres. Well, meters. Mr Dale might want to give a bit of thought to how that might be couched. There's lots of different examples in different landfill conditions, um, but, yeah, I understand the point you're making. Yeah. Just and I, a I little bit of flexibility in the wording, but... Yeah. the overall total sort of... I, I think in context, given that the, the Council may... Uh, require a third party contractor to undertake the work, uh, having an absolute number that the contractor then can be held to um, is uh, mm. a strong reason for, to have that wording as you suggest. Okay. Um, the next question relates to paragraph 31 and this is where you talk about liners. And you've, you've already responded to Mr Rumsby, but my question's just a bit more of trying to get an understanding of what might happen if there was a problem with a line of failure. Um, I've never heard of one, but he's alerted us to some overseas. How do you... If you needed to replace a liner because it failed in some way, how do you actually practically do that? Well, there's a, there's a practical limit to how much waste it has over the top of it. I mean, right. the way, given that the odour the odor issues associated with the neighbours, which we're trying mm. to manage. Um, uh, as soon as you open up uh, old waste, it's extremely odorous, um, and I wouldn't recommend that. Um, our, if the waste is uh, shallow, we can do that, um, but really, at the end of the day, the, the, the mitigating measure is dealing with the leachate losses to the groundwater system, 
and um, as I've stated, um, that's quite doable. Uh, so um, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend. Uh, we, we we let's put in context. We still have um, a, on the baseline. We still have a GCL geosynthetic grey liner, and 600 millimetres of 10 to the minus line, nine clay. So a tear in the plastic is not necessarily going to result in an immediate and direct report of large quantities of leachate. Mm. Uh, the next question relates to paragraph 60, uh, where you talk about climate change. Um, I think it's in there. Oh, you say halfway down increased mm. rainfall due to climate change mm. up to the year 20, uh, 2100. But I just um, couldn't find anything very specific anywhere in the evidence or the reports about how additional that rainfall is likely to be. I'll have to defer that answer to Mr Ingalls. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. I do know, though, that uh, given the quantities that Mr Ingalls has calculated, um, the swale drain that goes around the perimeter um, uh, is arguably over-designed in terms of capacity um, and the reason for that is that the drain needs to be maintainable. So we don't want a, a, a very confined little drain, we want a nice wide one that we can maintain. So those, those perimeter drains are over-designed in excess of the climate change and the 100 year rainfall expectancy. Okay. Um, the next one is paragraph 75. And I'm really asking you this couple of questions um, in response to some issues raised by submitters, and you've in fact referred to the um, Mosgiel Tauri Community Board here, but I think quite a few people have raised this. Just to assist their own understanding of what is going to occur on the site, how, because uh, these are portable litter fences that you've talked about, how yes. high do they tend to be? Uh, well, they use them on Green, Green Island, and I, perhaps I'll ask them. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Henderson, if he knows, but uh, I have never measured them, but they appear to be something like three metres high. Um, yeah, there's three metres, so I'm going to find. Um, and Mr. Henderson, you might want to comment on this as a bit of an overlap. Um, often the consent conditions for landfills include a condition that the consent holder needs to go and take litter off neighbouring properties if it arrives there for some reason, like a major storm, and uh, there's a bit more swirling going on than might be otherwise expected, or um, on public roads. And I just wondered if you had any comment on whether you would accept a condition like that if it was deemed to be appropriate. Um, yeah, from Council's point of view, if it was deemed to be appropriate, there would be no problem with that. Uh, uh, going back to you, Mr Coombe, again, yes. um, and also, again, talking about other landfill conditions in the country that I'm aware of, that you've heard me talking about already, I think nearly, I think all of them specify the liner designs. You know, they tend to drop down on a sort of cascade of this underlain by that, underlain by that. Um, and you've described in your reports and your evidence what you're proposing so I was just interested as to whether you see it appropriate to specify that in the conditions. You have mentioned along the way we'd like to finalise that in the detailed design, but that doesn't actually help most of the people in the room, including us, in terms of quite what it is you're going to do. So, Well, we've, we've specified one of two uh, types of liners that... Uh, are deemed appropriate in the, in the Wasteman's uh, landfill guidelines. <coughs> um, the big question is, is um, the preferred approach is to, in fact, from my perspective, um, is to put in a, a compacted clay liner with uh, the HDP, which is the type one, um, mm. type one liner, um, with the caveat that I've, on the base liner we would have an additional GCL added into that. <coughs> um, and that, the, the 
that's predicated on the um, the Lewis being modified to be to meet that that uh, ten to the minus nine specification, and for that reason the design, uh, particularly in the in the um, and the design report refers to the type two liner because there is a certain amount of surety associated with that. <coughs> um, I would prefer the type one liner. Um, if we can't do the type one liner, we'll do the type two liner. Um, uh, for that reason, we haven't been absolute in terms of specifying uh, which type of liner we we would mm. finally end up with. Well, maybe you'd like to all think about how you might approach that in a revised set of conditions, looking at you, Mr Garbutt, um, simply because when we're assessing the effects, we have to have some surety, I think, as to what it is that you're actually putting on the table it's sort of there, but not quite. And it might be that the condition, if, if there's a condition addressing it, that it actually includes both and has some wording around that. I don't know. But if you go and look at some other ones, Mr Coombe, you'll see that they all yeah. prescribe this. Uh, you, you're and right. it's intentional. Yes, I, I agree you're right. I, I know that the work that Mr Kirk has done in terms of assessing the effects of either of those liners, he has looked at either type in order to come up with... Um, mm. uh, the numbers that he's come up with, and um, uh, and I don't think there's an appreciable difference between the two, and, but I'll let him comment on that. Okay. Um, I'm still reluctant to um, offer a uh, single specific um, uh, liner. I'm probably happy to offer a preferred liner, uh, with the basis that if we don't uh, achieve the permeability that we're getting in the clay liner, we will then uh, defer to a type 2 liner. Um, quite happy for that as a, as a something that would be um, by way of a condition. Does, does that uh, sound something that you think might be appropriate? Um, not sure. <laughs> we don't answer your questions. Your <laughs> questions. <laughs> That's not the way we do this. What I'm trying to draw your attention to is that your your, dis your request for the flexibility, which I understand, yes. is um, a little bit outside the box. And the court has, um, when it's done, Hampton Downs and Cape Valley particularly, had some very extensive discussions about this sort of thing, simply because, obviously, it affects what's going on with leachate and all sorts of other things. And so they weren't willing to, I mean, Hampton Downs that I was involved in, there was certainly no willingness on the courts, uh, from the courts' perspective, to have any flexibility with that. They wanted it in there. So everybody yeah. knew what they were doing. It's like specifying cover. You don't just sort of say, oh, go and find what we can today. You actually say, well, we have to put this amount on. Otherwise, it all gets a bit loose. And the court then, I would think the councils would want to know, to be honest, what it is that they were expecting to arrive but I do understand your point about the permeability, so just give a bit of thought to that. Mr. Perhaps Hayden. I could ask uh, Mr. Kirk, when he's uh, dealing with his uh, presentation, to just discuss um, you know, the, his assessment of the two options. Um, mm. I, I think that I'll discuss it with the team and the client, but I would probably be ended up putting in a condition that says this is the preferred one, and if it fails, this is the second one. And that okay. would give well, two so options, which are both compliant with the um, Wasteman's guidelines, mm. um, and uh, and achieving the the losses that we are predicting uh, for either either mm. one. Mm. There's always this sort of, I mean, uh, as a panel, we've had this discussion between ourselves already. When you're looking at conditions, there's um, often a lot of thrashing that goes on between different, you know, the councils and us and the applicant and the submitters and eventually something's arrived at that might decide whether we grant consent or not. And you sort of expect, having done all of that discussion, that everyone understands what they're trying to achieve and there it is. But the way that we do approach the conditions is that the person who's reading it might not be any of the people in the room. Um, who's just, you know, a couple of years out of university and trying to write a compliance report. And so it's quite important that the conditions, as um, the Chair said this morning, are really clear and enforceable. So you don't want any grey areas, you don't want anybody sort of saying, well, that's not what we thought that you were going to do, and you need to be able to be clear about what it is that you think you are going to do and what they're enforcing or 
testing mm. you for compliance on. It can get really slippery quite quickly, some of that stuff. So, um, hence I'm being a bit picky about it, but it's up to you to put forward what it is you think might be an answer to yeah. the point I'm I'll, making. I'll, I'll, just... I'll draft something up, yes. Yeah. Finally, um, you were talking about the collection of leachate this morning in your answer to Mr Rumsby and co, and I just had a question about um, how quickly, if you have a leachate leak, <coughs> how quickly does it show up in the, in the groundwater? Well, the absolute answer will be answered by Mr Kirk if you ask that question from him. Okay. But what I do know is that it has to go through the compacted clay liner and at a permeability of 10 to the minus 9, it's going to take some time. Mm. Okay. Hence your discussion about what well, you're all talking about. Monitoring will pick these things up eventually, but it's not an immediate thing. Right. Okay, thank you. That's the end of my <coughs> question. Rising, right, any further questions? And Mr King, uh, no further questions from me. Thank you very much for your evidence. And we look forward to the write-up of your answers to Mr Garbutt's open question to you. Yep, thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr King. And we're still tracking right, aren't we? Uh, yep, we've got yep. 40 minutes to go. Yep, so great. So the next witness going. will be Mark Sterling. Mr. Sterling. Good morning. Now, having read the uh, submitter's evidence, was there anything in relation to your area of expertise that you felt you wanted to respond to to the commissioners and only in response to evidence you've read? Um, not in particular. No, thank you. Can you answer any other questions that the commissioners have sure. for you? Thank you. Do you have a copy of your evidence? Any questions from Mr. Sterling? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seem to be asking all the questions today. Mm. Um, paragraph 17. I just wanted to clarify what you were saying in this paragraph, Mr. Sterling, and this is where you refer to the P, uh, PSHA. Um, you appear to be saying in here that without this being done, that you would not have a high level of confidence in the seismic situation. Is that what you are saying in there? Yes, that's a fair comment. Okay. So you're comfortable with everything proceeding in the way that it is with this following later, if we grant consent? Are you not expecting anything much to come from that? Yes, correct. Usually a PSHA would be carried out uh, in the... Um, design phase of the mm. um, of a project on this scale. But it hasn't here. So the question for me is, as a professional in this area, are you comfortable with us proceeding without that being done before we make a decision? Yes, I am. OK, because of what you've explained in your evidence? Correct. Right. Um, that's all I had. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure I understood that paragraph. Thank you. And Mr. Sterling, no further questions from me, but thank you very much for your evidence. It was very helpful. Thanks. Thank you. You're free to go. So if we skip over Sam Webb, as I said in the list, so next witness will be Anthony Kirk. Commissioners. Good morning. And good morning, Mr. Kirk. And same question to you, please. Can you uh, outline to the commissioners anything that you've seen in the submitters' evidence within your area that you can comment on? And please just focus on the issues in reply. Don't repeat anything you've already written. Thank you. I have a few comments with regards to Mr. Frumsby and Mr. Ife's um, submission. So the first of these. Um, specifically with regards to Mr. Rumsby. Um, I considered his evidence and the references he provided. Um, one of the key areas was his identification of the disconnection between the MFE 
guidelines for landfills and recent releases of um, technical guidance and standards by the EPA. Um, in response to this, um, I've recognised that it's absolutely appropriate to include reference to the HASNO Act um, in, in the setting of the waste acceptance criteria um, and by requiring that as part of the landfill management plan. Um, I think that that will then also provide the flexibility to accommodate new releases um, and also changes to guidance by MFE. So that's now reflected in conditions 90 through 96, I believe it is. Um, my second point, um, Mr Rumsby references extensively international guidance uh, for landfills. I'll just point out that all such guidance um, suggest that site-specific assessment should be undertaken um, to close out any uncertainties, and that's what we've done. Mr Ife provides an assessment of PFOS for um, water quality. So the guideline value that he has referenced is a draft guideline value. It's not finalised. Um, it has been out since 2017 and, and there's no indication of when that may be finalised. Um, as such, it's not actually part of our criteria that we consider um, for regulation. Additionally, um, he did make use of the same calculation that I used, which is a very conservative calculation. Um, it doesn't consider mixing of groundwater with inflowing runoff, um, even in the subsurface. Um, if once that's considered, given just those very low rates of groundwater inflow, um, the dilution is extensive and the predicted concentrations would be far lower than that guideline, regardless of its draft. Um, Mr Romsby makes reference to the monitoring of background. Um, the approach that I have taken is consistent with the US EPA guidance, which only requires three seasonal monitoring events and only 10 to 12 samples for seasonal trend analysis. It's also consistent with the USGS 2020 guidance and it's consistent with the original author's document. Um, groundwater levels, Mr Ife refers to my cross section which shows that groundwater levels between shallow and the deep are consistent and suggests that they are connected in that space. I've used more than just those water levels to provide my interpretation and key to that is that the deep groundwater does not respond to rainfall events um, and it's of very low permeability that consistently hydrolic gradients um, are downwards. Drinking water aquifer, um, I'll just make reference to MFE contaminated land management guidance and that the determination of whether the aquifer is a viable water aquifer for, for potable supply. It's not just consideration of water quality, but also that potential yield. And in this case, the yield of this aquifer is incredibly small. So um, most of our wells have taken many days to recover after <coughs> they've actually been purged. I believe that's it. There's a range of other things, but I can provide those as a... Yep. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Mr. Kirk? Just had uh, two. Well, first of all, could you answer the question I just asked Mr. Coombe about mm. how long it takes for a, le a, leak a leakage of leachate, must yep. be time for lunch, yeah. to um, make its way down into groundwater? Approximately. Approximately. Um, just given all the different bits in between. Years. 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 Right. Yeah. It's going to not only is the landfill liner, um, it's going to need to traverse that, 
at very low permeability, but then also groundwater level is not at the base of the liner. It's going to be lower than that. So then there's all of that residual that strata to move through also. Um, that's in the vertical infiltration. Then there will be more years for it to for it to travel from its point of leakage down to where it would be intercepted um, at the top level. Um, just on your evidence, this is uh, paras 26 to 28. Um, where you, you're talking about landfill leachate and generation and so on in here in these paragraphs. And my question to you is when you did your calculations, were you working off any particular area of open waste? Yes, yes. Oh, and what was that? Uh, it was based on a thousand square metres. Right, okay. Um, and it was undertaken in stages, so we, we had the progressive development of the landfill with certain amounts of open um, daily intermediate final cover as it was progressing, and then looked at those various leachate amounts as as it went on, went through that development, and yeah, chose, mm. chose so the highest. if you only had an open phase of 300 that I've just been talking about, obviously your numbers would be a lot less, right? Or in not. terms of the leachate leakage, it's probably, probably not going to make a meaningful difference at all. Right, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and otherwise I just want to, for the record, just clarify that the discussions and correspondence that's gone on between you and Tonkin and Taylor, you all seem to have arrived at a place where you agree yep. on outcomes and conditions, yeah? Yeah, that's right. Okay, great. Thank you. That's um, all I had for I you. did have a response, uh, if it's of interest, with regards to the two liner types. Oh, yes. Thank and you. the potential yep. for um, criteria regarding that. So um, in previous applications that I've worked on, there has been a liner type specified in conditions of consent mm. um, and with the statement that or equivalent is demonstrated through um, liner comparison liner comparison assessment so it's quite common for us um, for example on the Pukatutu island uh, monofill there was a consented liner uh, but that assessment was then built into it and so we go through that process of um, developing a new liner that achieves the same performance um, mm. and is approved on that basis. Yeah, and I, I do remember that discussion with the court at Hampton Downs because we were trying mm. to work in a sort of BPO type option yep. um, because of this very thing of products changing over the years and not wanting to be too prescriptive, so mm. it kind of ended up at this sort of middle place. Yep. Um, so you will have some discussions with your team then about what some words might be around some of that? Yep. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the, the, um, possibly following on from questions um, that Jean's already asked and perhaps that Rob will um, cover off with Mr Dale in due course, but I, I guess um, a general question around um, the landfill monitoring program mm -hmm. and in your paragraph in your evidence um, number 92, um, you're talking around the conditions to capture um, the various actions that might result um, should the, uh, a leachate leakage be detected within a sufficient time frame, etc. Mm. So, um, as currently drafted in Mr. Dale's evidence, you're quite confident that the, the that there's an appropriate um, suite of conditions that set out those actions and those processes to ensure that the outcomes sought are, are going to be achieved. Yeah, yeah. So the um, there is a lot of weight put on the landfill management plan and in particular the receiving environment management plan. Um, we know that there are certainly mitigation approaches which will work. Um, so that's not in doubt, at least to us. Um, I think that having the flexibility to provide those sorts of actions within a landfill management plan um, does provide you the opportunity to not only um, learn from the baseline monitoring period um, and also the, the final design. Um, it gives you the opportunity to be um, 
more responsive, I guess, in terms of how you would go about doing it. I'm comfortable that the conditions which are there set out the framework for that, um, and I'm also comfortable that um, those early can early approaches in terms of repeat monitoring to confirm what that is, um, and then the approach to um, providing risk assessment and implementing Medigosha is appropriate. Okay. Yeah, I can reference the, the condition. There's a table. Thank you. Mr. Coote, just um, three matters from me. Firstly, in uh, response to the questions regarding <coughs> specification of liner parameters within the conditions, and it seems to be the applicant's now in a place where it's happy to do that and totally understand the need to have flexibility. If you want to pursue another option, I presume the condition that you're going to draft for us to consider in consultation with your colleagues or whoever is responsible for that, that would involve, of course, any alternative to the specified liner um, going through a peer review panel and a council certification process. So Absolutely. I imagine the wording we'll see will take that we'll in, be consistent into account. That. Yep. Two questions then arising um, from your evidence and also the matters that have been brought to our attention by uh, a large number of submitters. As you're aware, we need to look at, in terms of potential adverse effects, um, worst case scenarios, the outer envelope of what might happen and be confident that that's appropriately dealt with in conditions or through the assessments. So what I'm interested in and I'd like you to um, do for us, and I'm not expecting for you to do that right now because you might need to go away and do some more work on that. And this may already be in the material that we have, but maybe I've just forgotten where it is. So you can point to that if it's already there. But in terms of some of the contaminants that are of concern regarding human health, some thickening of pops, persistent organic, um, chemicals that can be dangerous to human health and PFOS and other, other indicator contaminants regarding human health. What I'm interested in is knowing, in a worst case scenario, if the material that will generate those contaminants is deposited in the landfill and then it gets into the leachate and then it leaks through the liner system in a, in a worst case scenario and then it ends up eventually, as you've explained, in the groundwater over a long period of time then it finds its way into the swamp wetland, then it finds its way into Otakaya stream, then it travels down the stream and dilution occurs and it ends up at the estuary mm. at Brighton where we've heard that submitters swim or like based on our site visit yesterday, I wouldn't like to swim in there yesterday anyway. Um, what I'm interested to know is in the worst case scenario, what would the likely concentration of those kind of key contaminants of concern regarding human health be in that area where the contact recreation is most likely to occur and therefore ingestion could occur. I mean, and in relation to guideline values, is it going to be close to guideline values, exceed them, or will it be miles away from guideline values? So I know it's difficult for you to put a hard number on that, but if you could give some thought to that and just let us know. In a worst case scenario, where would we be down there in relation yeah. to guideline values? I think it's worth probably discussing um, what worst case means. Um, now Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. I think it's worth actually discussing what worst case means. And it is a common approach um, when looking at these sorts of assessments of water quality. And the tendency there is that we stand up scenarios which are wholly improbable. Yeah. Yep. And so deciding at what point we say, you know, we can look at a line, for, a line of failure, we can look at um, importing of material from an air base that's got lots of PFAS in it, we can look at um, all of these different sort of scenarios that would end up in this waste being in Brighton. And that in itself is entirely improbable, even actually reporting down that far, yeah. to tell you the truth. Um, I can put some numbers around it, um, but some of those aspects around the probability of these things occurring, it's more of a, it's more qualitative. Yeah, yeah. and of yeah. course, um, in, in terms of my question, I'm interested in, when I say worst case scenario, something that's not fanciful, but yeah, okay. it's kind yeah. of a, a likely worst case scenario, yeah. given what you know about the design and operation of the landfill. Okay. 
then I'm not looking for risk upon risk upon risk upon mm. risk that's never going to happen. That's my concern. Yeah. And I understand that. And maybe you can just put down your assumptions that you've used if you could, when you document that for us. Yep, happy to. I'm about happy for that to be received um, whenever Mr Kirk's able to do it and if it's going to take a bit of time if that comes in as part of the reply that's that's fine as well. Thank you. Yep. yep. And then just one further question um, and it, I'm interested in the um, trigger level setting process and of course trigger level is a very common approach for projects like this. Uh, initial 36 months monitoring period, uh, trend analysis, look at establishing trigger levels. What happens after that? Do mm. the trigger levels then get reviewed and amended or are they just then set for the duration of the consent? I just can't recall what the proposal was for that. Yeah, so it's a trend analysis which um, means that every time you get a new sample, it's, it becomes part of the assessment of that analysis. So what a trend analysis trigger level is looking for is a statistically meaningful change. It's not looking for it to pass a fixed value. Um, and one of the really the key benefits of that is then it also accommodates improvements. If the concentrations go down, that's absolutely acceptable. We carry on, but at, at some point, um, it then over a long period of time starts to trend up again, then we have that trigger in terms of it moving away from that improved situation. So um, from in the context of um, providing operational flexibility, efficiency around um, things like repeat sampling and things like that, um, it's a far superior approach to just setting one number and then walking away. Yeah. Yep. So maybe I didn't ask a, a clear enough question for you. So. Mm. At the end of 36 months, trigger levels are established. So yeah. then they are they constantly or over time reviewed and then amended as appropriate, or do they just stay as they are for the duration of the consent? So that's what I was interested in. Yeah, so the I guess it's, it's difficult to get across what these trigger levels are. They aren't a number. Um, what it is is it's a statistical measure of whether it's trending up or down or not at all. So all you get out the end of it is a yes, it's going up, no, it's not going up. So what it requires then is um, in terms of what can be changed in the long term, you could change the method in terms of how it's developed, um, if, if you so desired, but otherwise um, what you're basically defining, for instance, is trigger level for calcium would be developed using the Mann-Kendall approach mm -hmm. for seasonal um, seasonal analysis and then it just becomes a data set so it's not actually a number that gets written into a plan it's the approach referencing a particular data set sorry i'm still not understanding where you're heading with that so so the trigger level is not a number that you then pass or fail that's right yeah so when you do the analysis say for instance you get a new sample you've got your ex existing data set it goes on to the end of that, mm -hmm. and then you run that statistical method again, and it will tell you whether right. there is an increasing trend, yep. in other words, a yes, or there is a decreasing trend. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's what we commonly see in council SOE reports, with the little green or red arrows as a trend going up. Yeah. So it's that kind of approach? Yeah. It is that kind of approach. Those are probably just people looking at it and going, oh, it's going up, <laughs> yeah, it's going down. But this is a statistically robust approach. Okay. Yeah. No, good. Thanks for clarifying that. And so, those particular statistical approaches, they would be codified either in the management plan or yep. in, in, in the conditions or something. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. No, thanks for clarifying that. And I have no further questions for you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirk. Uh, so, the next witness then will be Ellen Ingalls. Uh, but I'm just going to check whether we should break for lunch and now. So, would, do you have any open questions for Mr. Engel? Uh, yes, he will want to respond to something, I believe. And do you have any questions for Mr. Engel? Not at the moment, but I might expect to depending what he says. So. Uh, I think we've 
I think we can safely hear from Mr. Engels now, and then we'll break for lunch when we've completed with him, whatever time that is. Okay, okay. thank you. If that's right with you. Yep. Mr. Ingalls, can you please address the Commissioners on anything that you feel you need to reply to from the evidence you read from submitters? Uh, good morning, or oh, if Thank it's you. still morning. Um, yes, there, there are just uh, a few points that I just wish to uh, respond to. Uh, the first point is uh, Mr. Ife refers to the Wasteman's criteria and notes that the landfill is sited in a landfill at high, uh, risk of high stormwater flows breaching diversion drains flowing into active cells and merging with leachate. The site actually has been um, developed and is located actually at the head of a valley, so there is little or no upstream catchment which avoids the risk of significant runoff draining into the landfill. Uh, the landfill staging has also been developed so that it minimises the potential for runoff into the landfill. Uh, Mr. Ife refers to a series of wetlands con connected by defined watercourses and describes these as perennial, although noting they dry up during dry periods such as that over 20, the summer of 2021. Uh, site inspections have shown that during the dry season the watercourse has little or no flow and the records provided by Mr. York also indicate that flow seizes at the McLaren Gully Road during the dry periods most years, we would therefore consider this watercourse as an intermittent rather than a perennial watercourse. Uh, Mr York has provided information on flow and quality records he has been undertaking at McLaren Gully Road on a weekly basis or approximately weekly basis since 2013. The information provided is stage levels adjacent to a small V-notch weir at a location just upstream of McLaren Gully Road. While this information provides a general indication of when flow is occurring and an indication of the general magnitude, I do not consider that a more detailed assessment of flows is possible from, this, from the stage levels recorded adjacent to the weir. Uh, as the site inspection, uh, certainly that I carried out on October 2020, showed that uh, Flows over the weir were actually controlled by downstream conditions. So in that situation, the weir had approximately 150 mil of water over the top of it. But because of downstream conditions, there was actually no flow occurring. The flow is also uh, out of bank for higher flows. Uh, so while it would be theoretically possible to assess flows from, st uh, from stage records, that would require the development of a stage discharge relationship and I don't think a robust stage discharge relationship would be practically achievable for that site. Uh, Mr York has also noted uh, in his evidence at flow velocities of up to 8 metres per second were recorded crossing McLaren Gully Road and concludes that if a leachate breach was to occur it would reach Brighton in 40 minutes. Uh, no information is provided on how these velocities were assessed, uh, but I consider these uh, assessments unrealistically high, as certainly a flow of 8 metres per second would mean that the road would be non-existent in practically no time at all. Um, and the indicated flow time of 40 minutes from site to the lower reaches of the Otakia Creek, uh, which is approximately 13 kilometre flow path, equates to an average velocity in the order of 5 metres per second, which even during an extreme event is unrealistically high. Uh, extreme event times of flow would be expected to be in the order of 4 hours, with flow times from the site to Brighton significantly longer for normal and low flow regimes. Uh, and just one final point, uh, Otakia Creek in Marsh Habitat Trust raised concerns about the attenuation basin capacity, particularly with respect to increased, increased flows due to climate change. Uh, 
and I just note that all the design work has, uh, with regards to sizing and assessment of flows, has taken into account climate change out to 2100. Thank you very much for that, Mr Angles. We did view the V notch wear by McLaren Gully Road Easter Day on our site visit, and I did think it would be challenging to develop a rating curve for that site. Rod, any questions? Thank you, Mr Ingalls. Um, I have a question for you on um, the risk of ponding creating new bird habitat in your evidence in around paragraph 74, paragraph 75. So towards the end of paragraph 75, um, you've got a statement there um, to avoid the SRP attenuation basin becoming an attraction to birds. Remedial measures such as netting of the ponds basin are proposed to be proactively implemented. And I was just thinking that um, the sentence was there's a bit of internal inconsistency between the word of avoid um, as opposed to remediate. Um, and I wondered if you could just talk me through what you're meaning there I, I in terms would, of the content suggest, of your evidence. I would suggest avoid rather than remediate. Okay, so, so, so to avoid the but attenuation basin becoming an attraction to birds, avoid, avoidance measures such as? Correct. Okay, and you, thank you. Dan, any questions? No, I have no questions, thanks. Just bear with me a minute, Mr Ingalls, just want to make it over that. <coughs> And no questions of clarification from me. Thank you very much for your evidence. Thank you, Mr Angles. So the next witness will be Mr Shaw, but... Um, yeah, let's take a break, eh, because we might have some time yeah. with Mr Shaw. No, we're going through very well, yep. All right, so now um, I think we have to set aside an hour for lunch. Yep, so we'll still do that. So we'll reconvene at 1.20. Thank you very much. Thank you.
heard noise in that. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. We'll reconvene the hearing. And um, just, Mr. Garber, just before I turn back to you, anything from the reporting offices for us at this stage? Nope. All good. Back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next witness is Philip Shaw. Uh, Philip, good afternoon. And I'm aware you've read the evidence that the Dunedin International Airport Limited have submitted in this proceeding. Uh, can you please provide the commissioners any response that you have in your area of expertise to the evidence you've read? Thanks. Thank you. Um, if I may, may I first respond to uh, Commissioner Corner's question. She had two uh, questions that I felt were left for me to answer. The first of which was, um, what are the practicalities of managing birds at a landfill itself? Um, I've got a lot of experience in this, doing it myself on the tip face, using stock whips, pyrotechnics, um, kites, lasers, all sorts of different tools to do just that. I've got a team uh, in Australia that would be operating at Roachdale Landfill this week. I don't know if they're there currently right this minute. That's about 15 kilometres away from the Brisbane airport. Um, we, we operate and have operated that program for over 10 years and it's a very practical application of dispersing birds from a landfill. That said, it's a protrestable waste landfill and it, has, um, it is highly attractive, much like the, the Green Island site. So it needs constant attention with trained, well-equipped staff, and that's what's being proposed at Smooth Hill. Um, it is a practical application. It is something that can definitely be implemented and can be implemented well. Um, further to that, it's probably uh, what is planned more, more sophisticated than what DIAL would do in their own property uh, with dedicated staff that are trained and equipped. Um, don't believe that DIAL staff have dedicated people to that purpose. Um, second to that, there was a question, why not net from the start? Um, <clears throat> good, good question, because uh, really a net is a, a, a sable protection measure. It, it really would prevent any access by birds. That uh, measure was my recommendation on the basis of the original proposal before council had made a decision to separate waste at the curbside. We were then having to formulate a plan that was designed to accommodate the, the eventuality that it may be a mixed waste protrestable landfill. With that in mind, we put in place measures that were uh, a fail safe, such as a net. When council make, made the decision to adopt the four bins option um, and to essentially remove the, the bulk of protrestable waste from the waste stream. We left that measure in there. I, I see it as highly, highly unlikely to be necessary, um, but we left it in there as a safeguard and, and I stand by that being the, the ultimate insurance policy. I don't think it's gonna be necessary. So that, and w why would, um, you not want to put it in to start with. Well, it's it's expensive. It's it has its problems. It's got doors that need to be uh, operated in a way that allows the trucks exit and entry. Um, it's uh, it's got some engineering technicalities around getting piles uh, into the ground. It's it's um, yeah. It's it, it's got its own uh, constraints, but it it is absolutely doable. It's regularly done in, in the UK. Um, given that the UK has a lot of airports and not much land that's not within 13 kilometres of an airport, it has to allow landfills to operate, and these are protrestable <coughs> waste landfills to operate close to airports, and nets are regularly employed in those circumstances. I'm aware that in Northern Ireland, where nets are regularly have been adopted in the past, since the installation of nets, a lot of the Northern Ireland um, landfill areas, the local government areas, have adopted a similar um, organics processing, separate processing process, in which case the, the landfills have essentially become uh, non protestable waste facilities. Over the years, the nets have fallen into dis disrepair and, and 
the regulators and including the airports have accepted that those landfills now don't need the repair of those nets because they've got a waste stream that is essentially non-protressable and don't therefore attract birds. So that's what, you know, on balance, that's what we're looking at here is a similar type of landfill to those uh, that have now morphed in, in say, the Northern, Northern Ireland uh, example. Um, does that sufficiently answer your question? Yes, it does. Very helpful. Thank you. Have I got that on here? Um, no, it's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I mean, we, we asked these questions to tease some of the points out, obviously. Sure. Um, and to clarify things that aren't clear to us. So thank you for that. Yeah. Now, if I could um, respond to DIAL's submission <coughs> um, uh, provided by Mr Page. And I think... In essence, it will wrap up all the other DIAL um, submissions that have come subsequent to my uh, evidence in chief. Um, but if there are any gaps, please ask the question. Um, first, I will draw your attention to paragraphs um, 6 to 8, which refer to um, a question on obstacle limitation surface and whether the birds could be considered a penetration of that surface. It's a really interesting proposition, but one I would reject outright. Um, the idea of OLS, obstacle limitation surface, is in place as a requirement for fixed objects, not for moving uh, animate objects like birds. And I think it, it should probably be rejected by the Commission. Um, I would draw your attention to the NZ, NZ Civil Aviation Authority's Advisory Circular 1396, which refers to OLS as, as fixed ob objects, um, or, or sorry, the penetration of OLS, more correctly, is referring to fixed objects. I'd also question if birds are considered a, a penetration of that uh, conical surface, the, the OLS, where does that stop? What about birds that are flying across the runway, um, which happens on a daily basis at, at the international airport? Is that a penetration of the surface every single time a bird flies through, in which case uh, every airport on the planet would need to note that obstacle? <clears throat> Turning now to paragraph 11, um, it's, it's our, uh, my assertion and in, in, in my evidence that what we're after here is zero increase in risk. That's what we're um, accepting as acceptable risk. Um, the airport, Dunedin Airport, has an existing high risk and therefore we are um, creating, or well, we have created, uh, conditions and management plan that is multifaceted. The risk not only at the landfill itself, but in the way in which the closure of the Green Island landfill is, is to be progressed, also uh, has to be taken into account in the overall risk. And in doing that, we we believe, I believe, um, that if it's done really well, the overall risk can actually be less than the current circumstance, particularly as the Green Island landfill uh, winds down its, its operation. Those birds, those particularly the black-back gulls, are going to need to find somewhere else to go. Over time, they will leave the region because there's simply not enough food. But in the interim, there's a high risk period where those birds will relocate potentially to agricultural lands, to um, anywhere that provides an alternative food source to that regular um, fruitful uh, food resource that they find every day at Green Island. Um, in parallel with that, the proposition is that we actually manage 
the breeding cycle so that the next generation of birds coming through is, is limited, so that we're not, um, not only attacking you know, the, the food source, but we're also restricting the breeding success. And we've had a lot of success in di diminishing regional populations of uh, opportunistic species like this in Australia. We've, for 26 years, been managing Australian white ibis in a very similar integrated way to put pressure, on, downward pressure on um, bird populations in a region, and, it, and it's highly successful. Uh, and that was piggybacked off a very significant bird strike that occurred back in 1995 uh, with an Australian white ibis at Gold Coast Airport, which essentially kick-started most of the work I do now. <coughs> Uh, I draw your attention to paragraph 12, where there's a question uh, as to whether it's clear to me that I understand that DCC proposes to re re receive truckloads of fish waste, offal, avatar waste, general waste and commercial operators from commercial operators. <coughs> I am and I was at the time of uh, presenting my evidence. The, my understanding of um, historical loads uh, uh, thanks to Chris's um, support in providing information, is that those sorts of loads are less than once a day. They're around about 1% of the whole, the total volume. And in the way in which the processing will occur, that they will be immediately buried within a pit. Um, and for all of these reasons, I believe that uh, there's the no, no way in which birds can access the food, in which case there will be not a desire for the bird to continue to come back to that site because there's no uh, benefit or gain as a result of that attempt. Um, paragraph 13. Ideally, protressable waste would be achieved, um, and, but I'm informed that that cannot be guaranteed. Will that uh, is in reference to the fact that uh, there will be some food waste mingled. It, 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 it's entirely impossible to remove every piece of food from every waste stream. Um, so I understand that that's not a, a possibility, but I believe that the amount of food waste that will enter that food stream to be so small as to be insignificant as a food resource for birds, as has been demonstrated at uh, sites where it's similarly, um, the, the waste streams are similarly treated, such as at Cape Valley, and my examples earlier of, uh, of Northern Ireland. Uh, paragraph 16 refers to, it's not the birds on the ground which are of concern to DIAL, um, but birds on the wing in the airspace. As in my evidence in chief, there is three attributes to the risk presented by pr predominantly purchasable waste landfills uh, being in the vicinity of an airport. The first is, as mentioned by, by DIAL, in the airspace itself, above the landfill. Um, obviously, a bird uh, spiralling upward in... Uh, into the airspace could be hit by a plane coming through that airspace. There's a second uh, aspect, which is uh, the, f the flight path risk. In, in other words, to get to that site, the birds will have to transit through certain airspace that may be or may not be across the airports uh, or the aircraft uh, airspace. And then there's a, another risk, which is the spillover risk. In other words, uh, we believe there's a population of potentially upward of 8,000 blackback gulls in the Dunedin area. Um, and those numbers simply would not be possible without the support of the Green Island Landfill providing the, the uh, food resource to, to drive that population growth year on year on year. So that's what we call a spillover risk. In other words, there may be juveniles that can't access that food, but they're out in the landscape uh, in year one and two after, after hatching and they're looking for food um, 
and it could be at you know agricultural pursuits. It could be where there's tilled land, uh, and and they're searching for food in the landscape generally. And that's a, p a potential for the birds to enter into the fl the aircraft flight path, or indeed to go to the airport itself. And that's what I refer to as a spillover risk. It's spilling over outside of the realm of the the landfill itself, and um, those birds are finding themselves in potential conflict with flight paths. The assertion in paragraph 16 that it's really only the, the above the, the landfill itself that's a problem, I contend is actually a poor estimation of, of how the risk is uh, realised in the landscape. It's only one aspect of the risk and it's probably the least important of all three of those aspects, aspects of risk. And you know, later in the evidence, uh, DIAL refer to you know, a, a crash that occurs because of uh, a collision with a bird above the landfill. The, the reality is that's a lesser risk than potentially birds that are derived from an attractive feature that then fly through the airspace on takeoff and landing um, and is much more in the realm of the airport to manage that, that problem. <clears throat> which is actually referred to in paragraph 17. Um, paragraph 17 also refers to the avoidance of an increase in aviation hazard, which um, I will talk to shortly on um, the, the, I suppose, the, the wording around avoidance versus mitigation. I'll, I'll talk to that shortly. Um, paragraph 17 also raises the concern of if escalation has to occur, um, there will be a time lag between when the birds be present a problem and the implementation of the next measure and the next measure beyond that. Most of the measures that we believe are going to be necessary, if at all necessary, would be able to be escalated immediately. So these are escalation triggers that allow someone at the site that's trained and prepared to respond. I'm extremely confident that that on its own, with the measures around the separation of the food waste, is going to be sufficient to manage this problem to a point where those triggers will not need to be um, implemented, beyond which, for instance, um, bailing of waste or wires are necessary, and as an ultimate requirement, the net. If that is required, I do see and understand the concern about the, the delay, and in that instance, it, um, there may be a, a mechanism, I'm not sure what, to actually di divert the, the uh, causation somewhere else if it, if it happens to be a, a certain type of uh, material that's causing the attraction. If there's something in particular that is seen to be the, the causative agent, what can we do about that? Can we divert it in the interim? Um, and I suppose this is where the question of being um, an adaptive management plan and whether that's sufficient or not comes in. In my view, it's a very appropriate way to handle this particular issue because it's a, a very low probability in being necessary. I now move forward to paragraph 37, and it refers to um, a CAA document which says material for land use at or near airports, and notes that the CAA, C, sorry, ICAO, that's the International Civil Aviation Organization advice that municipal solid waste sites be located no closer to 13 kilometres from the airport boundary or property. I'd just like to correct that. There are no guidance materials, there's no uh, 
ICAO material that says do not put landfills within 13 kilometres. It says be alert to these and if necessary have an, an aviation um, expert conduct a study to identify what options there might be to mitigate. And they're the words used in, in aviation talk. Um, that's exactly the approach that we've adopted. So it's in line with best practice. It's in line with uh, all the ICAO recommendations. It's in line with uh, the New Zealand Civil Aviation Authority guidance. Um, and we're now not dealing with a, a truly protressable waste landfill. We're, we're dealing with essentially a non-protressable waste landfill, although I acknowledge some protressable waste will be buried immediately and a slight, very small amount will be mixed in with a general waste. It could be argued that from a bird's perspective, this is a non-protressable waste landfill. And for that reason, um, the actual requirements diminish significantly. It, it's a completely different kettle of fish to the proposition of simply replacing a like-for-like -like landfill as the one that's at Green Island. And um, so I do. I just point to paragraph 37 uh, as being inaccurate in what the ICAO documents actually say. Paragraph 40 speaks to what an acceptable aviation hazard is, who, who is it acceptable to, and what defines acceptable. Well, I think the airport's evidence and mine agree that no further increase in risk is acceptable. Um, so now what we need to do is measure that. We need to make sure that that's the case, and that needs to be a measurement of the overall risk, taking into account what would otherwise happen if we didn't have this landfill um, proceed at Smooth Hill? How would, for instance, the Green Island closure be handled? Would it be uh, deliberately and, and carefully managed so that that population of birds that's there doesn't present a new and radical risk as a result of those birds scattering around the landscape, which is something that's going to need to be managed uh, in the event of uh, Smooth Hill, and really probably should be managed no matter what, but at least within this context, we know that it's a condition of this particular um, proposition, and therefore uh, will be something that the proponent has to follow through, follow through with. And this is absolutely in the interest of DIAL that that is done well and comprehensively. <coughs> It's interesting, from my point of view, um, to note that the airport is asking the question about acceptable risk when, in fact, they choose to do certain activities that are considered um, uh, of concern around airports but are on their own airport. For instance, the harvesting of grass on their own property is something they do uh, and is in uh, ICAO document 9981 under aerodromes, one of, uh, among which is uh, garbage dumps and landfill sites, but agriculture, cattle feedlots are also in that list. And uh, the airport have chosen to continue with that activity uh, on their own property. They've obviously accepted that level of risk, some level of risk for their own activities on their own properties. Um, paragraph 41 uh, contends that the test for acceptability of a hazard is also needing to be determined by uh, the Civil Aviation Authority and that isn't something that um, the proponent has any control over, nor um, does the airport have any ability to influence. So I, I can see the point of view, 
that CAA uh, are the regulator for the airport and they're outside of this process. What we've done is we've made the thresholds for escalation extremely tight. Um, 20 birds of any one species, uh, over 50 grams, identified on site is considered a breach. Um, we, we've had uh, consultants doing surveys on the airport's land now for four months, uh, January through April, three surveys per month. So 12 surveys, and on five occasions, um, <clears throat> those surveys have, have calculated uh, more than 20 birds of that mass on the airport land airside. So the, we've, we've essentially got a situation here where the airport's property itself supports a greater number of birds regularly than we're proposing to allow as an acceptable level at the landfill. So um, extrapolate that if you may, um, by September we might be expecting to need a net over the, the airport were the same conditions to be applied uh, to the airport. Um, <clears throat> paragraph 43 talks to a mine-focusing scenario for DIL that a blackback gull brings down a commercial aircraft. Uh, it's, a, it's a nightmare scenario, sure, but it's also extremely remote as a probability. And I would suggest that the, the, that concern should be something for an airport that agrees that it has an existing high risk, that it might like to look at it within its own boundaries to see how it might avoid such an occurrence within its own uh, operations. <clears throat> and then on paragraph 44, there's a reference to uh, an estimate of risk based on low probability but an extremely high consequence. Um, and of course, estimations of risk in that traditional way uh, mean that something you know, of, of extreme remote possibility but still may have a very, high up, a, a very high consequence doesn't necessarily mean an extremely high risk because the probability is so remote that it diminishes that risk to an acceptable level. Um, that sort of a scenario where we've got the catastrophic outcome is something more likely to happen on takeoff and landing uh, where there are birds of significant numbers than it is on an occasional high-flying bird. Um, most 95% of strikes occur uh, below 500 feet. It's mostly around the airport that strikes occur, and therefore the further the distance away from an airport you go, the less likely um, those interactions of birds and uh, aircraft in the airspace occur. Paragraph 47 talks to uh, adaptive management, which is, I think, something I've already addressed and I don't probably need to delve again unless you would like me to. I was going to talk to paragraph 51, which again talks to you cannot uncrash an aircraft, which um, I think I've also... Uh, covered. Um, I think that should do it. So are you happy now to see if we have any questions for you? Yep. Sure. Rose, any questions? Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you um, based on Matt Bonas's evidence. Um, he's put together an assessment on um, planning aspects. 
I'll just take you through those now. So um, in his assessment, he puts forward that um, in order to properly assess risk, um, that there needs to be a robust model on which a site-specific risk assessment for Dunedin Airport would, um, and that would require several years of standardised surveys and longitudinal studies, etc. And I wondered if you had a view on that, please. Yeah, look, in an ideal world, actually, what you would do is have the latest um, avian radar technology and understand what your um, bird movements around that airspace look like. And it, it's something that would feed into a model over many seasons because seasonality is important. Um, the dynamics of how, uh, in particular, the blackback gull population change as a result of the closure of, of Green Island is going to be really important in what happens in the airspace. So we we're, um, bring, bring that back. What best we can do is do survey work that identifies where the birds spend most of their time and how they move around the landscape as a result of that. Um, ideally, that would have happened for years in, a, in the lead up to this um, application. Uh, Ideally, the airport would have really robust data about what happens actually on the airport and around the airport, which they don't have that sort of data in, uh, available. So my recommendation was as soon as we could reasonably do so, let's start to collect that information. And that's what's been implemented since January. We now have, and we've got the consultants out at the moment this week for the May survey. So. Um, I understand that's contracted through to June and will continue on potentially after that. This is establishing that information so that we can actually update our risk assessment on an annual basis based on current information. That's the idea. Sure. So earlier you were referring to the existing behaviours of, of the gulls on the existing property, so that those were the surveys you were referring to? Or is that different? Yeah, look, that, that is referring to those, but... I attended a survey um, in May that mm. formulated a one-off set of survey results that helped us formulate the preliminary hazard assessment. Um, we acknowledged <coughs> within that assessment that basing um, our, uh, our assessment on one round of surveys is limited. Um, it's the best we had, we couldn't do any more. Now, you know, we've undertaken to collect further information so that we can be more rigorous in that risk assessment into the future. Okay, thank you. And uh, a further question I have uh, relates to the indirect risks of um, bird strike. So in um, Mr. Bonas's uh, evidence, he talks to the fact that not only um, is the airport concerned about the direct catastrophic risk, mm. that there could be a series of um, indirect costs that would impact the functioning of the airport, effective functioning, um, and an accumulation of a, of a series of those may result in effectively the airport not being able to function. Do you have a comment on that or a response to that aspect of the evidence? Yeah, look, it, it, it's absolutely correct that knock-on effects from bird strikes are very costly. We estimate that um, Bird strike, a single bird strike on average using airline data is somewhere in the vicinity of $69,000 uh, $69, per strike. Um, that includes, on some occasions, damage caused, on other occasions, delays, and, and on other occasions, no, no, uh, no impact at all. Um, so they're real, but that, to me, means that the measure needs to be that there is no additional bird strike risk as a result of this pr proposition. Um, and if we can demonstrate that that's the case and demonstrate that we have in place the measures to, to reach that outcome, then I believe uh, those knock-on effects do not... Um, they're not additional to anything that's occurring at the moment. OK, thank you. <coughs> any other questions? You've answered a lot of the questions I had, but I've got a couple left, so I'll just... Um, one of them is just, uh, and I kind of alluded to this earlier in the day, and I'm not quite sure you've quite answered it, so I'll just ask it anyway. It seemed to me when I was reading your evidence that there were a few inconsistent references to avoiding retrospable waste or minimising it. 
um, in terms of the measures and the way that you're assessing the big package, and you've kind of referred to both in your, in your um, oral presentation this afternoon. So are you saying that your understanding now is that it's minimising it rather than avoiding it? Minimising the food waste? Yeah, well, food waste is what we're talking about most of the time. Yep. I know what you're talking about with odorous wastes and special loads and all of that. <coughs> yep. But as evident from my questions of Mr Henderson, it's, and as you've said, you can't really ever quite promise that you're going to take it all away because it's almost impossible to do that. So you're really talking about minimising it as much as possible. It, absolutely. And yeah. and compared to a truly protestable waste landfill, it, it's diminished to such an extent that from a bird's perspective, on the evidence we see at places like Cape Valley and other places where similar waste streams are, occur, that it's not attractive to birds. Mm. Because we're, we're going from a, a highly commingled, you know, food available on a, on a very um, abundant basis to almost mashed in with the rest of the, with the bulk of the waste that it's such an insignificant amount that I um, can't see it being attractive to birds. Um, even if the occasional bird came to have a look, we've got responsive actions in place to make sure that those birds are um, not allowed to settle in and, and become um, habituated to deriving some benefit from that food resource. Cape Valley was of interest to me because mm. um, when it was consented I was sort of peripherally involved for somebody. Um, and when I went back to check on the original consents for Cape Valley, it was consented as a landfill that could take petrissable waste. Mm. So has the council up there, or the councils perhaps, done the same as Dunedin is proposing now? so that they've now excluded that, and this is what the change is? Correct. Right. Yeah. Last question. Um, you heard me asking Mr Coombe earlier about the um, size of the open face, and I just wondered if you had any comment you wished to make about that. Uh, it, it's almost inconsequential inconse because there's not going to be an abundant food supply. I, I of course, have been as I described earlier on landfills where attempting to keep birds away where there is actually two open faces, I've, I've had to do that. It's almost impossible because you're on this one mm. and then they fly to this one. Um, absolutely tightening up the face is really important to, to make it a very targeted area that the birds can approach. But we're dealing with semantics here because the idea is that that food is taken from that that face anyway, and um, we, we haven't even discussed this, but my, my answer to you is I don't see it as a big issue at all, the size of the face. Um, it, it's really critical that those special waste loads are covered immediately, but the amount of protressable waste that I foresee in that uh, primary um, tip face is, is so minimal that the, the size of the face is gonna be not that important. Thank you. That was all I had. Thank you. Mr Shaw, just a couple of matters from me. I'd just like to take you to your paragraph 81 in your evidence, just to start with. In, in paragraph 81, in the last line, you talk about measures adopted at Green Island, Smooth Hill, and at the Southern Black back gull breeding sites. So in terms of our role, we can certainly impose conditions telling this consent holder to do things at Smooth Hill. Um, I guess we could probably impose conditions telling them to do things at Green Island because that's also a council owned site, but <coughs> I'm not 100% sure that we would have legal ability to do that. <coughs> Unless of course it was volunteered by the applicant. But regarding the breeding sites, I mean, in your figure four to your evidence, you've got a nice picture that shows a whole lot of sites all around Dunedin and further afield where these gulls live and I presume breed. Uh, we can't impose conditions requiring this consent holder to do things at sites where it doesn't own the land, which I imagine is most of those sites. 
So I guess what I'm interested to know, and in terms of ensuring there's no increase or exacerbation of the existing risk based on the existing uh, status quo scenario at the airport in Green Island, etc., if we were limited to imposing conditions that only applied at Smooth Hill and not at Green Island and not at these other breeding sites, would that achieve the outcome that's necessary? No increase in risk. Yes. We've we've got the we've got the triggers in there which allow um, a response um, to maintain the the level of bird population that is any way attracted to that area to an absolute minimum, below 20 birds, that distance from the airport is almost incon inconsequential. Um, it really is going to be very important though from, from anyone who wants to fly out of Dunedin Airport that all the stakeholders work out how to handle the closure of Green Island. You know, it's, it's a really... That many blackback gulls uh, looking for a new food supply is going to be really interesting. It's going to be an interesting time. And it's going to need to be managed really carefully. And whether you have the power to do something about that or not, that's the reality. <laughs> so that's all I can tell you as an expert. But at the site itself, we have the measures in place that I believe are enough to maintain no additional risk. Yep. And just following on from your answer there, just paragraph 107 you talk about, and you just mentioned it now, a regional population management approach, which uh, your expert opinion is that that's uh, necessary, and I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Uh, who do you see doing that? Who would be responsible for the regional population management approach? Um, it's a. It should be a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm not as familiar as I should be with your um, environment. I've dealt with environment Canterbury and, and others, but the equivalents down here, yeah. um, DOC, those uh, those bodies are important to be involved in that. Uh, the local uh, First Nations people might be involved in, in that as well. Definitely the airport, definitely the council. Um, I'm not sure if it's ORC's place or not, um, but it should be a multi-stakeholder approach driven, I believe, by Dunedin City Council. Two more questions. The threshold on a, of um, 20 birds, I think, is it 20 birds of 50 grams or less? Um, of more, or more. Or oh, more, sorry. Sorry, yeah. sorry, can I just clarify yeah, yeah. one thing you said? The, the sites in the map that you refer to aren't breeding sites. They were the sites that they were present, whether they were loafing or feeding, in the, right. in the surveys that we took, undertook um, back in May last year, and yeah. they continue to be monitored monthly since January this year. Um, we don't know yet where the breeding sites are okay. and that's because surveys haven't been completed through the breeding season which is expected to start okay. toward the end of winter and into spring. Yeah. Um, at that point we would find that there would almost certainly be a concentration in one, two, three, maybe, maybe up to ten but there'd be two or three really significant colonies somewhere in, uh, in the region that we could focus our attention on in terms of managing um, that breeding uh, success. Yep, no, thank you. That's a helpful clarification. The threshold, um, correct me if I got the numbers wrong, 20 birds of 50 grams or bigger, what's the, what's the magic or the science behind those two numbers, the 20 and the 50? Uh, it's professional judgment based on um, birds under 50 grams, um, unlikely to be very significant for an airport. There may be large num numbers of, let's say, finches um, 
that would be four and a half kilometres away from the landfill, which would be of no major consequence at, at the airport itself. Mm -hmm. um, so they're birds under 50 grams. The birds above 50 grams, we're, we're talking um, starlings and above, essentially. Um, that would also take into account for ducks, skulls, um, and, and the, the larger birds that we would be mostly concerned about from, a, from an aviation hazard. They are either large in their own right or they're flocking species. Um, starlings, for instance, uh, a very significant risk of, of brought aeroplanes down, responsible in fact for the worst civil aviation disaster caused by birds back in 1960 uh, in Chicago. Uh, um, and, uh, sorry, not Chicago, in the, in the States. And um, what, what we're dealing with there is a, a, a tightly form yeah. flocking species. So that, that's what we're dealing with of the type and size and then the number is essentially, well, all, um, all sites have a background number of birds that occasionally use it. So we, we can't expect always that site to have zero. That, that would be unreasonable to expect. So from a professional judgment point of view, where do you draw the line? Do you think 10 is okay? Do you think 15 is okay? Do you think 50 is okay? Um, in consultation with my team, who have got years and years of experience in these sorts of things, we, we decided upon 20 as being an arbitrary figure that is um, somewhat um, in the middle of a reason, what we believe is a reasonable position uh, for the range of options we could have chosen. There's no precedent for this, unfortunately. Yeah. And last question, in, in terms of the sort of adaptive management slash escalation approach that's being um, suggested, <coughs> and again, I might not quite have this right, but the deterrence and lethal methods that are part of that escalation regime, should they, or are they going to be applied at the outset regardless? So if some birds are attracted to Smooth Hill, would someone immediately go and shoot them? Or would there be poison laid in anticipation of birds arriving, for example? And is there a reason why that just isn't done as a matter of course? It seems a fairly simple thing to do. Poison, poisoning birds, I can talk to in a minute, but the, the whole concept of having to um, cull birds as, as part of this um, was actually a part, it was already in the management plan before I had reviewed it. I, I spoke to our, our team and suggested maybe it's not even necessary to be in there. They wanted to keep it in there. I think it's a, a last resort option because I'm so familiar with using dispersal techniques that work, using stock whips, pyrotechnics, noise, um, gas cannons, other, other things, as long as they're portable. Um, now, we also operate, I know, sometimes in urban areas, and we've got to be careful about the noise that we um, generate as a result of that. So we, we have worked out many different techniques that can be interchanged so that there is no reliance on one particular tool too often. I, if, my, um, if my business... I, took on a contract to manage that problem or that potential issue at uh, Smooth Hill, we would not rely on culling at all. Um, we would have it there as a last resort if necessary, but it's certainly not something that I see as being absolutely likely to be required um, unless the contractor who's chosen thinks that's, that's the, you know, obviously I can't tell other contractors how to do their job. Right. So just to summarise then, you, in your experience and opinion, the uh, dispersal or the dissuasion methods would be sufficient to deal with your anticipated uh, size of the problem that might occur here? Absolutely. And, and the idea is that you don't ever let birds feed at the landfill because if they see this as a, as a resource that they can return to regularly and get some gain from it, they will make it part of their 
um, normal behaviour patterns. If you can stop them from doing that, they've wasted energy in attending the landfill in the first place and flying away from it. That's wasted energy from a, from a biological perspective. Um, they won't want to repeat that waste, so they won't come back again. That's in human context how, how it appears. All right, well, thank you very much. No further questions from me, but obviously thank you very much for your evidence. Um, it's probably apparent to you and everyone else in the room and who's watching that bird strike is a key issue for us to consider, so we do appreciate your assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Shaw. <coughs> So the next witness should be Peter Stacey, who <coughs> I understand should be online. Hopefully, Peter, are you there? Just turn it on, I think. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, just checking. I think your audio is coming in. Can you hear me, Peter? It's Michael Garvin, yeah. solicitor here. Yes, loud and clear. Yep. And good, so you're not in there. And just confirm you are Peter Stacey? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, now, are there any issues that have been uh, addressed in relation to the submitter's evidence that have uh, landed in your area of expertise that you want to comment on to the commissioners? Um, there's nothing specific that I, I want to comment on. I think that. Um, my evidence um, has responded to their concerns. Yes, thank you. Can you answer the Commissioner's questions? Yes, good afternoon, Mr Stacey, and I'll just see if we have questions for you, Roz. Any questions for Mr Stacey? No questions. Jan, any questions for Mr Stacey? I've just got a few quick questions, Mr Stacey. Good, good afternoon. I don't afternoon. know, have, have you been listening throughout the day, or have you just come online now? No, I've been listening on uh, and off um, since this morning. Okay. Um, you will have heard me asking questions about the open face at the tip area and I didn't know if you had any comments you wished to add about that because in my own personal experience with landfills there has been a tendency to impose conditions on uh, open areas not just for fire risk but for odour management as well and you mentioned in your evidence that you had some experience with a number of the landfills in, North, in the North Island that I have been referring to today. Yes, so, yes. any comment on that? Um, yes, I, I, was, I actually spent this morning trying to hunt down the consent conditions for um, Hampton Downs, and I, I couldn't actually find a specific value um, that, that uh, is in their consent. Um, I. I note from looking at aerial pho photographs, it seems as if their working face is sort of quite large, something in the order of about 500 square metres. Um, so um, that's sort of very similar to the Red, Red Bell landfill as well. Um, and I, again, I, I don't know what a, the consented area is for that site. Um, I guess they are significantly larger than what's proposed for Smooth Hill. Um, but if I look at Green Island, which I guess there's sort of similar volumes, that the, the area there seems to be around 1,000 square metres, um, sometimes increasing to about 1,500. So I guess the, while the, we, we have this 300 square metres, which is probably more of a theoretical um, area, there needs to be some flexibility from a procedural perspective. And so something between 300 and 1,500 in my mind would probably be appropriate if you were going to um, specify a limit. Um, yeah, that, I think that, you know, I, I, I would have to check with DCC if they thought that that was something that they could uh, work with. But from, I guess, thinking from an odour perspective, um, I don't think that there's going to be a, a huge range in, in the odour potential from it being, say, 1,000 to 1,500 um, square metres. Ultimately, as small as practical. Yep. Um, one of the things that I noticed in your assessment, so going back to the actual application documents, is that you, and it's not in your evidence either, is um, fog. And when we did the consenting for Hampton Downs landfill, we were in a particularly foggy part 
of the North Waikato. It still is very foggy, obviously. Um, and it was quite an issue, and um, Merv Jones came along and had to do quite a lot of evidence on the effect of fog on odour and how it tended to kind of hold the odour down, if you like. I mean, I'm just yeah. talking about odour generally because of, I, I need to, but... Um, and you didn't seem to have addressed that in your, your sort of description of weather and climate conditions. Have you got anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, generally the Waikato is quite a different proposition to um, the elevated areas we have around Smooth Hill. Um, I, I, it's not something, like you said, I, I specifically touched on, but if I, if I look at the a, a copy of the, the wind data that we've collected for the site, um, the frequency of calms that we um, have measured over the last year or so is, is very low, and the, the frequency of low wind conditions is also... Um, it doesn't appear to be particularly high. Um, so I, I guess I, I haven't seen anything in any of the data that are review, reviewed to suggest that um, we're going to have these in, in, inversion conditions that are going to create an odour issue. Mm. OK. Um. And that was all I had because we've sort of addressed a lot of the other things along the way today. So it took away quite a few of my questions eventually. Um, thank you. And <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Stacey. No further questions from me. Thank you for your evidence. Though. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, the next witness then will be Andrew Whaley, who again uh, hopefully is online. So checking, Andrew, can you hear us? Stand by it. Good afternoon, Andrew. This is Michael Garbett, solicitor speaking, just checking you can hear us. Your mic is muted, I'm told. Can you check that, please? We'll try again. Can you hear us, Andrew? Okay, you can hear us. We can't hear you, so you might just... Can I hear? Can you hear me now? Ah, good, yes. Just introduce yourself and we'll just check the volume. You're coming through now, thank you. He's gone again. No, uh, can't hear you now. I think the audio is coming through your microphone on your head there. Uh, good. Yes, you can hear me, Andrew. I can hear you. I'll start again if that's all right. Yes, no, good. You're coming through loud and clear now. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, can right. you I'll leave the headset on this time? Yeah, appreciate but, that. Uh, so, yes, uh, Andrew Whaley. I'm operations manager for our transport business here at GHD, uh, and I prepared the statement of evidence for the integrated traffic assessment for the project. Thank you. Is there anything in the evidence of submitters that have touched on traffic issues that you feel you need to respond to? Uh, nothing that hasn't been responded to already in the statement of evidence and nothing new. So, okay. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Can you please answer Commissioner's questions that they may have for you? Yes, certainly. 
Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Wade. I'll see if we have questions for you, Jan. Any questions? No questions from me, thank you. Yep. Hi there. Um, Hi. We, we had a couple of um, submissions, or at least one, uh, expressing some concern around, um, I guess, risk management in relation to fires. And um, we're, he we're hearing from experts in risk ma management specifically for fires later, but I wondered from a, a transport or traffic perspective whether you had any particular insights or concerns around, particularly around the peak, peak traffic hours um, and any, anything in terms of emergency services. Uh, probably not, other than the proposed road upgrades would probably help the scenario of the fire at the landfill itself, that um, we'll, we'll actually have a, a um, substantially unconstrained route from Dunedin City or probably Mosgiel or East Torrey where the closest fire um, services would be um, up a, an improved McLaren Gully Road into the landfill site, um, which would probably reduce response times should there be a fire. Um, also with any fire tenders, they tend to um, approach at speed, and with the improved network, I'd suggest it would actually be safer to be getting to to the site than the current um, McLaren Gully Road and associated infrastructure. Um, but in terms of the infrastructure associated with transport, port, uh, no concerns with respect to um, increasing any fire risk. Great. Okay. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thanks. So Mr uh, Whaley, we understand how in terms of the um, consents required from the City Council, the road um, upgrading and, and widening, etc. How you've now amended that design to avoid uh, the roadside wetland areas and we've received a diagram this morning from Council just showing that. Um, the question I have is in terms of the um, changes you've made, will the road widening that's now being proposed still impact on um, habitat that may be the home to lizards, so the rank grass habitat that may be a lizard habitat, is that still being impacted by the road widening, do you know, or is that some other expert uh, can answer that? There's probably some other expert in terms of the changes to the roading design, it was purely to avoid those wetlands. Right. So if there was a lizard that were within that wetland habitat, then that's avoided. But in terms of um, if there were uh, lizards or so forth living in the general grassland uh, that was already affected by the road design, um, that would remain unchanged with the updated design. Okay. And that was the only matter I wanted to ask you about. Um, thank you very much, though, for your evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. You're free to go. Thank you. Now, the next witness, number 12 on the list, Mr Wasat, is in town but en route. So we're tracking through a bit quicker than he had planned. So uh, <laughs> what we might do is jump to number 13, Matt Welsh, yep, and fine. then come back to Christian when sure. he arrives, if that's OK. Yeah, no problem. So uh, hopefully... Matt Welsh, are you online and can you hear us? And are you able to come on the screen? Um, yes, I'm online. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear and see me? <laughs> We're just getting that. Ah, yes. So we can see you now, Mr Welsh, thank you. And we can hear you loud and clear. Good. Um, You've been listening to proceedings. Are there any matters within your area of expertise, landfill gas, that uh, have been raised by submitters that you need to respond to? There are. Can, can you, there are, yes, thank you. Can you please address the commissioners on that and take care not to repeat stuff that's already in your evidence, just to respond to matters in other people's evidence? Thanks. OK, no worries. Hello, commissioners. Um, so... Um, Andrew Rumsby had um, some comments in lines 76 to 79 of his uh, submission in relation to the setting of an oxygen trigger level for the operation of the gas extraction system. Um, and he is suggesting that the value should be less than 5% volume volume in all operating extraction wells. Um, 
in relation to that, um, I personally think that the best way of approaching that is for the party who will undertake the detailed design and operation of the system to be identifying um, what an appropriate um, or what the appropriate trigger levels for the operation of their system should be, including for um, oxygen. So, but noting that, in relation to a 5% VV value, I have seen that used in, at other sites, many other sites, um, so I don't particularly disagree with it. I just feel that the operator um, should have some say in selection of the appropriate values. So what I think I would suggest there is that um, a landfill gas operation and maintenance plan for the landfill gas extraction system should be included um, as an additional item into the consent conditions. Um, that should include what are the required operate, operation and maintenance requirements for the system, including the setting of trigger levels for uh, gases, including oxygen, and then identifying what the appropriate response actions would be to um, achievement of those trigger levels, which could include things like turning valves off or further investigating you know, wells for fires and, and that sort of thing. Um, and that should obviously be submitted to the, um, should be prepared in advance of the, the system being um, commissioned and should be subject to review by the, um, the expert panel. And that is my response to Andrew Rumsby. And was there anything else you wanted to say in response to evidence you viewed or are you happy to take questions now? No, I'm happy to take questions now. And so just while you, uh, I'll just pop in here, so in terms of what you're recommending an additional management plan, I just didn't quite catch what you called it, was that a landfill gas a management? Land landfill gas operation and maintenance plan specifically for the landfill gas extraction system. It seems to be um, just something, I read the, had a look at the conditions again last night and it seems to be something that sort of um, would typically be required but is not um, specified in that document at the moment. Um, thank you, that's a helpful suggestion. Um, this morning I outlined to um, Mr Garbutt some uh, parameters that I think are necessary to include in management plan conditions. And so in that regard, um, I'd appreciate it if you could liaise with uh, Mr Garbutt and also Mr Dale and um, between the three of you, uh, come up with some wording for a condition along the lines you suggest. Okay, no problem, I can do that. Yep. Now, just in terms, just for a minute, 42A um, <coughs> reporting team, who's your ear expert? Can you remind me of that? Or are you talking to me? Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm talking to the regional council officers. I'll come back to you in a okay. sec. For the, oh, sorry. For the landfill gas? Yeah. Richard Chilton, he's watching just now. Okay. So, um, in terms of that extra bit of work that's going to be done to assist us, maybe if Mr Chilton could be involved in that too. So, in terms of the wording that's now being proposed, or the proposal for landfill gas operations and maintenance management plan, um, if he could be involved in and put to the wording for that, would appreciate that. Yeah. So Mr Walsh, are you happy to work with Mr Chilton on coming up with some wording as well? Sure, yeah, that's no problem. Great. Right, see if we have any further questions for you. Right, there's any questions? No questions from me, thanks. No, but uh, um, apart from that, we don't have any further questions for you, but we look forward to that further bit of work you're going to do for us. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Thank you. Welsh. <coughs> Okay, so uh, we'll move then to Anthony Dixon uh, addressing risk of fire and he should also be online. Checking Anthony, are you there and able to come online? No sign of him?
questions, not you. Yep, okay. No sign of those gentlemen online. Yeah, but why don't we take an early morning tea? I was going to say, you could either adjourn or we could skip right through to um, Tanya Blakely, who'll be the next person who's available if you want to carry on, or we can take an afternoon tea and try and carry on in the order get Anthony Dixon online. He was certainly online moments yeah. ago. You might have just dropped off. Yeah. So um, <coughs> the update, Mr. Bossart is on his way, but won't be here till three. Yep. And uh, Mr. Dixon is tied up till three thirty. Yep. So um, I'd probably move to Tanya Blakely a bit. Yeah, my, my next Let's plan. Do. Let's do that. We'll go now. Yep. Yep. Sure. You're up, Tanya, please. <coughs> Good afternoon, Dr. Blakely. Good afternoon. Yes. Uh, now, you have some items to respond to within your area of expertise to matters raised by submitters. Can you please address the commissioners on that initially and then answer their questions, thanks. Sure, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so I've got a, a couple of items that were raised by submitters that I could speak to. Sorry, I need to my, so I can see. <laughs> um, so... A couple of, I guess, a couple of themes that came through in the evidence from submitters. So Calvin Lloyd um, and also Andrew Hutchinson um, and Otokia Creek um, Marsh Trust. Uh, the first is around um, additional fauna. Uh, so this is for freshwater ecology. So additional fauna that's been identified in the lower Otokia yep. Creek, um, which I've actually discussed already in my evidence. I think it's page, uh, sorry, paragraph 73. Uh, and that's come about um, in the evidence, particularly regarding the use of eDNA um, samples being taken um, in the lower catchment. Um, I certainly agree with the findings there. Um, it's a, um, a, a novel technique to be used to get a better understanding of the freshwater fauna in the creek. Uh, I guess the, the most important point uh, for this scenario um, is that that e DNA sample, to my knowledge, was taken very much down in the lower mm. um, catchment. And so, as you, I'm sure you can imagine, that, that then captures quite a lot of linear length of waterway upstream. So it's a, no real surprise that there were a, a number of other um, freshwater species that were identified. This is uh, also in line with uh, Andrew Hutchins' Um, evidence. Uh, I understand he resides or resided at 197 McIntosh Road um, and commented uh, around seeing giant kōkapū, uh, longfin eels and other freshwater fishes. Uh, again, looking at that on Google Maps, um, that's a, a long way down in the lower catchment, so again it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I guess the important uh, point f as far as my evidence is concerned um, is that I think it's, it still stands that the eco ecological surveys that I've done upstream um, in the unnamed tributary, immediately downstream of the designation, um, I believe are, um, are still consistent um, and accurate, whereby only longfin eel and shortfin eel were found. Um, the other main point I think is good to note uh, as in the evidence of Coven Lloyd, um, where there's some, some evidence regarding uh, the appropriateness of the IAN's ecological impact assessment guidelines. Uh, again, this is discussed in my evidence. 
paragraphs 31 and 33, I believe, and also on 75. Um, <clears throat> I guess the, the key things from my perspective are that the, the IN's ecological impact assessment guideline is a framework. Um, it, it was um, prepared uh, originally in 2015 uh, for New Zealand um, and has since been updated in 2018. Um, it's peer-reviewed, uh, it's been tested uh, in uh, um, numerous legal settings. Uh, yes, it's a framework, but it's actually a really important piece of framework because it does provide us with a nationally consistent direction, a really important approach to assess ecological impacts. And, and without something like this, it actually is a very subjective process, um, whereas in fact the, the IAN's ECIA guidelines provides um, an ability for technical experts to be objective um, and consistent um, and provide repeat, repeatable and robust assessments. Um, ecological value is one of the components that was particularly noted by the submitter. Um, it's important to remember that when assigning an ecological value, it's, it's not something that we pull out of thin air. Um, it's very much applying um, a set of criteria. Uh, and those criteria help inform and frame decision making around values. Uh, I think those are the two main things um, that I thought were important to note. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Blakey. I'll see if we have questions for you, Rob. Nope. Danny, any questions? No. Yeah, it looks like you're getting off very lightly. I don't have any questions <laughs> or clarification for you either. So, just to anyone in the room and anyone who's watching, just because we don't have questions doesn't mean we haven't read and appreciated the evidence. There's just no matters that we wish to clarify or get further explanation on. It doesn't mean that there's not issues that we still need to consider. So yep. We just don't need to clarify anything with you. So. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think what we'll do is carry on the ecological theme now we've moved to it. So following Tanya, we have Jazz Morris. I think we'll call Jazz next, and then we'll go back. I see Christian's here, so we'll go back to him after Jazz. Thanks. Good afternoon, Dr Morris. Good afternoon. Yes, and uh, you've been observing the proceedings. Again, uh, are there matters that you feel you uh, should rightly respond to from submitters within your area of expertise? Yes, there's uh, a couple of matters. Please do so. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, I just wish to, to respond to a couple of matters in Dr Calvin Lloyd's um, evidence as they pertain to effects to wetlands downstream of the proposed landfill. Um, they relate broadly to the theme of hydrological impacts to those wetlands. And the first point that Dr Lloyd makes is around um, the potential for an increase in, in dryland weed species within the swamp wetland below the landfill site um, as a consequence of reduced um, runoff from the designation area. Um, look, I, I agree with the point and it's a logical uh, counterpoint or, or, or complementary point, I would say, to my assessment that wetland obligates um, may decrease, um, but I note that the applicant and the measures that are outlined in the Vegetation Restoration Management Plan would directly address um, that effect um, as far as removal of those dryland weeds are concerned. Um, and make an, that, that um, my evidence also addresses a number of points in relation to the magnitude of um, the expected effect in terms of hydrology on that wetland and, and as does the evidence of uh, Mr Kirk and Mr Ingalls. Um, the second point that, that Dr Lloyd makes with um, respect to the valley floor marsh wetland system uh, that is in turn below the swamp wetland um, and the resilience of that system to the effects of drying, he refers to, um, a, as do um, myself and Dr Blakely throughout our discussion of these areas, uh, the downstream pond which he, in which Dr Lloyd states to be a sink for water rather than a source um, I guess I wish to comment without straying into um, matters of um, stormwater hydrology um, that it is my understanding in terms of um, wetland ecology that, that a, you know, a pond um, within a wetland would be both a sink and a source and that I've observed on three occasions at that downstream pond, um, two of which were in dry periods, April 2021 and February 2022, 
um, that although the site is overall very dry at those times, that downstream pond delivers um, a just discernible um, trickle of water downstream, and it's you know that um, type of, of phenomenon that informs my view um, that that pond is of importance to buffering the effects of runoff downstream. Um, I also wish to address, um, as far as Dr Lloyd's evidence and also that um, of the um, Otakia Marsh and Creek Habitat Trust, um, apologies if I have that name around the wrong way, uh, around their objective to enhance the ecological values of the Orthokia Creek area. Um, and I submit that um, many of the measures with respect to the draft vegetation restoration management plan achieve that objective um, over and above what is required on an effects basis um, as part of the proposal. Um, and in particular, um, the fencing and, and removal of weeds from wetland and forest areas I see as a, as a benefit noting to some degree that those measures are required as, as effects management, um, but I consider, as I've just mentioned, these to be over and above. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you, Dr. Mara. Let's see if we have questions for you. No questions from me, thank you. No questions. Hi, um, I'm interested in, I, I see there was a bit of backwards and forwards in the further information request and teasing out um, the utility or the applicability of the um, biodiversity offset accounting model. Um, and so I just wanted to, I guess, tease out my understanding of that in this context with you. Uh, so in paragraph 73 that you noted that the application and development of those models is relatively recent. I'll let you get to your... Yeah, so you, you noted that um, the model is relatively recent and it's an evolving area of practice, but that you do agree that models may assist in, this, in the process. So are you, are you saying that um, you do see the merits of applying that model s somehow within this process, or are you saying that, generally speaking, you can see the, that the model has benefits in some situations and that in this situation you're not recommending that that is applied? Um, I think to, to best answer that question, I should unpack a couple of the aspects within it around um, the matter of it being a relatively recent um, area of best practice, and then um, whether or not I would recommend that that be applied in, in regards ecological effects of the proposal. Um, my first point that I would um, draw your attention to is that the, the point is made in my evidence in response to um, draft conditions that came from the ORCs um, technical expert on this matter, which would have strictly required the use of um, these sorts of modelling approaches as far as effects management for um, ecological effects. And um, I disagree and continue to disagree that those ought to be required. Um, and I, but, I, but I do note um, that they, they assist insofar as they allow you to um, quantify what it is that you are, um, what impact it is that you are having to a degree. Um, and therefore to, to have some reassurance that what you are proposing um, in respect of that effect is, is a, applicable and is, and is helpful. I do not see those as being necessary and indeed the best practice guidance um, for these sorts of models um, essentially states just that. They are not in and of themselves um, the, the full package of things that needs to be done. It is not simply that one runs the spreadsheet, determines you know, the, the area to be... Uh, <laughs> enhanced and, and then goes with it. it, it very much forms a part of the package. In terms of the recentness of the ap approach, I, it's fair to say that biodiversity offset modelling is, is an older approach being 10 plus years. Um, and the biodiversity compensation modelling approach, to my understanding, um, is, a, is a model that has been um, proposed by a number of ecologists led by TNT only in the last year. Um, I've not got any awareness of where that approach has been applied um, and I would say that that is uh, a very new um, matter that, that's, that's not come to my attention in any other, in respect of any other application that I'm involved. Great, oh, thank you, that's really helpful. Thank you. 
And no further questions from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Morris. We can go back now to Mr. Vassard. Good afternoon, Mr. Fassard. Good afternoon. Um, now, you've heard me ask the previous witnesses, is there anything in uh, your area of expertise that you should respond to submitters' evidence on? No, not that I, I've already done so. Yes, no, thank you, nothing new. Thank you. Can you ask to the Commissioner's questions? Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, Ros, any questions? No? Yeah. I've just got a very quick question, and I don't know if you heard this um, earlier. We had Philip Shaw here not that long ago this afternoon talking about bird management and so on. Um, and he was talking to us about um, his preference to use various mitigation measures to deter birds from the landfall rather than culling methods. And I just wondered if you had any comment on... And his point was, you need to keep interchanging these methods. You don't just keep doing the same thing because they just get used to it, really. For residents in the vicinity of the landfill, I've just been pondering um, the effect of intermittent noise, especially if it changes all the time, and whether you had any comment on that. You know, so if you're talking about, for example... Um, I don't know, shooting in the sky or the use of gas guns or whatever it is to send them away. I've often heard in previous work that I do as a lawyer, you know, that sometimes intermittent noises can be worse than a continual noise. So I just wondered if you had any comment on that at all. Can be. So um, I've not assessed this per se, um, but I have considered it. Just a general uh, principle is what I'm getting at, really. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the compliance with the... Uh, condition three of the, the original designation, then um, the intermittent bursts of energy wouldn't have um, any bearing on the actual uh, overall noise level that's received by um, <laughs> any nearby noise sensitive receivers. Um, there is the matter that uh, intermittent noise um, can be uh, more disturbing. Um, I think that there is a consideration that the noise sensitive receivers are um, really quite distant um, from an acoustic perspective from the actual site. I uh, believe I think the closest one is about 400 metres away. Uh, the aspect, uh, sloping aspect um, of the, uh, the landfill is also in the opposite direction to those closest receivers. Um, so there will be a, a shielding effect um, by the intervening topography. Um, so I think that those uh, factors considered, um, I don't anticipate there being um, a significant impact upon uh, noise sensitive receivers within the, in the area. Um, in the opposite direction, uh, we're looking at something probably between about one and a half to two kilometres distance. So that really is a, 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 a long way for the noise mm. to attenuate. OK, that was all I had. Thank you. Okay. I'm just interested in the matter of the construction um, noise management plan. The, the proposal, as I understand it, is that if... Um, and I'm talking in terms of the land use consents required from the District Council, so it's the road widening and, and realignment activities that my question relates to, okay. rather than activities within the designated site, which are covered by designation conditions. I understand. <clears throat> but in terms of the, the road works, um, I think I understand the proposition is that if those works are closer than 40 metres to an existing residence and the residents are home at the time, then a noise construction vibration or a noise management, construction noise management plan would be produced, which to me seems a pretty awkward kind of approach. I don't understand why a construction noise management plan isn't just produced at the outset, which is, in my experience, quite common for infrastructure projects. 
so I guess it all depends upon the noise levels. Um, if we can you know, predict noise levels that are either very close to the limit or exceeding the limit, then I would definitely say have a construction noise management plan um, to, uh, as a framework to enable for those mitigation measures such as screening and, and so on. Uh, in this particular scenario, uh, we wanted to try and provide uh, flexibility um, and we thought it was overly onerous um, to uh, require uh, clients by uh, condition of consent uh, to do a construction noise uh, management plan, uh, even though the predictions were uh, complying quite comfortably um, with the noise limits. Is it really onerous to do a construction noise management plan? Uh, not overly onerous. Um, it is a live document. It isn't something that should be written. It, there is, should be no final version. It should be something that is continu continually referred to, updated as required. Um, so there is an element of uh, time and therefore cost to it. Um, and if I considered that it was uh, appropriate, then I, I would have backed that. Um, but in this particular occasion, which is, I would suggest, you know, maybe more the exception than the norm, then I, uh, I suggested that uh, actually that wasn't a requirement. Only that if um, the activity was to be uh, within 40 metres, um, the residences were to be occupied because it was um, difficult to actually tell um, at the time. Um, and also, uh, if there was a particular reason why works needed to be undertaken um, outside um, of the typical construction hours, uh, then that would trigger the need for um, a suitably qualified um, expert to uh, produce the construction noise management plan. But isn't that a bit awkward, because then works have to stop while some experts engage to produce that plan? Well. It should happen as part of the construction methodology. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, mate, you, you've given your opinion on that. I appreciate that. Maybe, Mr. Garbutt, if you could consider as part of the ply whether or not, just as a prudent measure, if it's not overly onerous to have one of these things done up front, which, in my experience, is the more common approach. No, thank you very much. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're free to go. Thank you. It looks like it's a good time for afternoon yes, tea, isn't I think it? So. Yes, so um, we have, just so you know, Karen Seavright is here and we could go to her, or yep. Anthony Dixon is available from 3.30, so yep. um, maybe if you come back at quarter past, we'll, we'll drop to um, Karen Seavright. No, that sounds good. Yep. And then we'll just box on for the rest of the afternoon. Yeah. Sounds good. Be great. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, everyone. We'll adjourn now till 3.15.
no, no, it always throws me. Let me say mm. somewhere in about the fourth paragraph about her PhD. Kind of said it's more like management yeah, management. Right. Yeah. No, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. <coughs> oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. Lost, lost your chair? <laughs> yeah, cool. Alright, well, I'll sit that for 30 years, so um, I don't know if Walsh is engaged. Yeah, good afternoon. We'll reconvene the hearing. Thank you. And the next witness is Karen Severite. <coughs> good afternoon, Mr. Severite. Good afternoon. Uh, now, I understand you have one matter you want to respond to in terms of evidence that you've uh, read that is in your area of expertise. Can you please respond to that and then answer the Commissioner's questions? Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Um, so I noted across a number of the submitters' evidence, um, there was a, sort of a common theme uh, of concern about contamination risk on the coastal environment down at Brighton Beach and down at Otakea Creek marsh habitat, and that included a coastal avifauna. So just in response to that, um, based on Mr Ingle's evidence, my understanding is that any effect on water quality in the wetlands that are directly downstream from the landfill will be less or minor, and that given that any effect on water quality decreases as you progress downstream, that any effects in the lower reaches of Orthokea Creek and Brighton would be undetectable. And so using this information, I, I've concluded that uh, there won't be any contamination risk to avifauna that are using uh, this habitat at Brighton Beach and Otakea Marsh. Thank you. Yep. All right, let's see if we have um, any questions. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I note um, a submission by Yvonne Tako on behalf of Te Arunanga, um, or Atako, uh, notes that there's concern around the lethal shooting aspect of um, Taiaka species, as that would not be consistent with the aspirations of Te Arunaka. Um, and I wondered if you'd had a chance to, um, or if you had any observations on that in terms of the, the likely species um, that may. Um, fall under the lethal method, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, just any general observations you had in, on that matter? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, the only species that's proposed to be shot specifically is uh, black bat gull, so that's uh, uh, not protected under the Wildlife Act, so that would be the only species that could be, could be controlled using that method. Um, and <clears throat> there are guidelines in the draft uh, bird management plan around making sure that the, the marksman, if, if this method of management is implemented, that they're familiar with uh, identifying the species correctly to make sure that we're not going to accidentally shoot a, you know, other species of red bill gull or black bill gull. Yep. Great, thank you. And that leads on to my other question. Um, curious as to whether the, um, I'll just get my notes up, um, whether the EIA, NC, ECIA method accounts for cultural values in any sense, or is that kind of um, science-based proxy for yeah, that's, the species? That's, that's sort of separate. We don't do cultural impact yeah, sure, assessments. Yeah, sure, sure. OK, I just wondered if there might have been a, yep. an intersection there in, in your methodology. OK, thank you. Um, and I have another question here. No, I think you've probably covered my other question. Thank you. Yeah, just, just a thought that's just occurred to me really with one of your answers is when you're doing culling of, say, the black, black bat Backed. girl, yes. you just need to find another sort of species. <laughs> um, does that tend to affect the nesting of any other birds in the vicinity, just the fact that this is going on, or are they quite 
ambivalent to the whole thing? Yeah, they seem to be pretty ambivalent. So blackback gulls um, and dot, for example, they often cull them in braided river bed habitat in the South Island, and that's to protect um, the braided river birds that are endemic. And yeah, it doesn't seem to have any impact on them. Generally, it's not so much the shooting, it's they might do like egg pricking or something like that. Um, yeah, and it doesn't have an effect on, on species around them. Okay, and, and given your answer to Rose a month ago about making sure the other gulls that are protected are not shot, yep. are you aware of any incidents where that has occurred in New Zealand with this sort of methodology? Not for gulls that I'm aware of. I'm not all over that, but no. yeah, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay, that was all I had. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to ask you about the um, eastern falcon, which is a bird that's of interest, obviously, to yourself and some of the submitters that we're going to hear from. And just repeating again what I said this morning, that this is a designated site, so the range of considerations that we can make with regard to activities within the designated site is limited. So in terms of um, the activities that require consent from the District Council, which is the land use consent for the road widening and realignment works, can you just remind me, uh, do any of those works propose a risk to the Eastern Falcon in your view? So just the road widening works? No, there would be, I guess, a, a very small loss of potential foraging habitat for them, um, but that would be very, very small scale compared to the very large home ranges that the eastern falcon have. Uh, it doesn't provide nesting habitat for them. Uh, yeah, so a very small loss in foraging habitat would be the main, the main impact of that. Yeah. All right, thanks very much. No further questions. Thank you, Ms. Severight. <coughs> um, so I think we'll drop down to Megan Lawrence next. Megan, if you can come forward, please. Hello, Ms. Mar uh, Ms. Lawrence. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, you've provided evidence in relation to archaeology. Was there anything that submitters raised that you read that uh, called for your response and within your area of expertise? I f my evidence largely addressed uh, quite a bit of what's been raised, uh, but I did just want to provide uh, updated maps to sort of show the relationship of archaeological sites and those archaeological site types. Who Thank you. Can I you provide that to the uh, hearing administrator and she'll distribute that to the commissioners. Thank you. <coughs> Can you explain to the commissioners what yes, that is? absolutely. Once they've had a chance to yeah. look at yeah. it. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, so the map you have in front of you is just all the recorded sites that are within the vicinity of the project area, um, the project of the designation area shown in red, um, and they've been divided into s more broadly speaking site types. So we've identified uh, heritage sites or post-contact sites which relate to farming in the area largely, predominantly. There's a couple of transport sites in there too. Um, and then we've also got sites relating to mana whenua. These include midden sites uh, and oven sites and occupation sites. Um, a vast majority of those are located along the coastline, but we've also got some midden sites which are located in proximity to the area. Um, and then also up on the other side of the state highway, there's also the PAR site there as well, which is worth noting too. Ready for questions? Yes, absolutely. 
I haven't got any questions. No. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you've um, addressed the submission by um, uh, Miss or Mr Major. Um, and there was some concern expressed around um, some Māori um, associations or evidence of occupancy um, in the area. And I just thought um, it would, might be useful to explain the nature of, of that concern and perhaps why, in your evidence, um, you don't consider it to be appropriate for you to comment any further on, on, on those um, aspects. Would that be fair to say? Yes, yeah. when it comes to cultural values, it's not my place to comment on that. I'll, I'll leave that to Runaka. Um, in terms of physical remains, uh, archaeological remains, uh, during our assessment, we undertook a physical survey, desktop research, looking at aerial historic documents, and specifically within the project area, we haven't identified any direct evidence of physical remains in that area. There is evidence definitely is evidence of occupation within the wider area. Um, that is why we recommend to get an archaeological authority to cover the whole project area as there is that potential to encounter unrecorded sites relating to mana whenua occupation. Great, thank you. Thanks, helpful. Mm. Can we begin, Maria? Yeah. You did, right. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Lawrence, just while we've got you here, if you could just remind me, so the, um, the the aerial photographs that you've just tabled today. So the blue stars on the road widening um, yes. route. So can you just, and it may be in your report or your evidence, I just can't recall. Can you just run through, so 67, 81, 82 and 80, what are those sites? All of those sites uh, do relate to historic farmsteads or, um, yeah, farmsteads essentially. Um, Pre-1900, most of them are recorded on a 1901 military map. Um, because they're located along the roadway, we don't expect there's that much risk of encountering uh, too much any archaeological remains associated with occupation because the occupation of those sites is more likely to sit further in within those properties. Um, a lot of archaeological remains we find in association with uh, historic occupation is backyard dumps <laughs> and yeah. ditching your rubbish uh, in a pit out the back of your house, probably not at the front of your driveway. So we think it's low risk, likely to be fence posts, post holes, that sort of thing associated with driveway access more than anything else. <coughs> yeah, I do recall that from your evidence and I remember thinking at the time, how significant is that fence post and post hole? And Possibly not that significant in the overall scheme of things, no. And that's why we have basically recommend a, a uh, yellow zone for that area. So we're not doing standover monitoring in that particular area. Um, it will be, we'll provide contractors with an archaeological briefing so they know what they're aware and should be notifying us about. Yeah. Um, but if they do encounter anything, they can give us a call and we can come out and record it. Right. And so just looking at um, the conditions that Mr Dale has, so in that, just expanding on what you just said, so if the um, roading contractors discovered something you would brief them what to look out for. If they discover something, they stop and they basically give yes. you or your equivalent a call. So yes. the contractors themselves don't mess with the site. No, they leave that, to you. that is exactly what yeah. we say to them on site. Leave it exactly where you find it. Uh, take a picture of it. It's really <laughs> helpful. Send it through to us and we'll get someone out there as soon as possible and go from there. We normally say leave a buffer around that area yes. and then you can move on elsewhere on the project. 10 metres, say so a 10 metre yes. buffer, put some tape around Exactly, it that's on. it, exactly. Yep, yep. I know that's good, thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Um, so we had, uh, I heard the chime of the clock, so we had hopefully <laughs> Anthony Dixon was online from 3.30, so just checking, Anthony Dixon, are you there online? Can you hear us? Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Dixon. This is Michael Garbett speaking. Can you hear me okay? Yes, that's clear. Uh, thank you, Michael. Oh, good, thank you. We can hear and see you. Uh, so you're on the screen in front of the commissioners. Uh, thank you for attending. Can you please 
respond to anything that you've read from submitters within your relevant area of expertise and take care not to go repeating material in your evidence, just responding to matters that have been raised since you wrote your evidence. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll respond uh, to Mr uh, Rumsby first. Um, <clears throat> I went through Mr Rumsby's comments um, on my submission, uh, on my evidence rather, and <clears throat> he made a comment, and I think it's a small point, but he made a comment that I didn't address the uh, tetrahedron model, phi tetrahedron model in the evidence, but look, that's noted and that was taken into account in uh, in preparing the advice, uh, so that was uh, that was considered. Um, he also makes a comment that um, controls proposed by the applicant are not preventative. Um, look, the, the primary uh, controls are around reducing the frequency and the extent of any fires that may occur at the surface of the landfill, um, but we're practical and reasonable preventative measures that have been proposed, uh, such as waste screening, compaction, and uh, uh, covering of waste um, for a number of reasons with, within those, which I've elaborated on in my, in my evidence. Um, Mr. Rumsby also mentions controlled measures for lithium batteries are not proposed. Um, look, I've proposed a practical approach to the current limitations of waste collection and sorting in the event that limit uh, lithium batteries that can cause fires uh, when they're received in a landfill um, and have proposed a number of mitigation measures including controlled um, controlled active tipping area under constant observation with trained staff able to extinguish any surface fires caused by a battery and I note there's local programs in place to assist and mitigate the likelihood of fires by uh, having facilities in place to uh, uh, and now and, and further in time to reduce the number of batteries that could end up in the waste stream that could uh, turn up at, uh, at uh, this site. Um, also, Mr Rumsby makes a comment, and I think it's probably been covered by Mr Coombe, uh, about uh, subsurface fires and the risk of damage to liners. Um, and the position is to prevent a subsurface fire, and I've deferred to Mr Welsh on that, in terms of gas uh, minimising oxygen in ingress and gas monitoring. Um, um, in terms of, I think there's just one more point, and look, it's uh, the uh, sort of responding to my evidence by Blair Judd, um, that the site presents a higher risk of fires migrating off site. And look, that's being addressed. Uh, I gather Mr. DeMar follows me, and he'll talk about that in, uh, in his comments. So, they're my responses, uh, Mr. Garvin. Thank you very much. Now, please answer the Commissioner's questions if they have some for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Jane, any questions? I've really only got one because you've just answered one of my questions. Um, but just turning to your suggested uh, tip face area of 300, uh, no, I think it was no more than 300 metres to manage fire risk. I'm just taking it that's based on your experience with other landfills, and if you could give me any examples. Um, look, my advice was 300, uh, particularly that doesn't go above 300 uh, in high, high to extreme fire risks. They're the situations where um, there's a higher risk of having a fire um, that could potentially also get off site. So look, I didn't specifically say just 300. Um, Look, the smaller the area, the lower the risk um, is generally how it occurs. And where I have seen fires, and I've done a number of projects, and I'm working on one at the moment, um, the, the, the area of exposed waste has been quite large and in the orders of thousands of square metres. Um, the, the, <coughs> the, the operators, it's in their interest, and the good operators really know their, their craft by keeping the tipping face to a quite, small, quite a small area because um, what that does is they can optimise the compaction. The benefit for a fire is that it reduces the air getting in, but the real benefit for the operator is it uh, maxes the, maximises the amount of waste that they can landfill to extend the life of the landfill. So um, that, that's, that's sort of my experience and observations, and hopefully that answers the question. Mm, very, very good answer, thank you. That was what I needed to know. I've got no other questions for you, thank you. Okay. Some questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Dixon. No further questions from me either. Okay. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Dixon. You're free to go. Thank you for your time.
Okay, thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Now, the next witness should be Paul Demere. <coughs> Paul is hopefully online also. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Demir. This is Michael Garbett. Just checking you can hear us okay? Yes, Mr. Garbett, I can, I can hear you very well. Oh, good, thank you. And we can see and hear you. So uh, hopefully you heard Mr. Dixon. He's just preceded you, and I think he threw to you to answer one question. But can you also respond to anything that submitters have raised since you wrote your evidence that you feel you need to respond to? And then answer Commissioner's questions, please. Uh, in terms of the submitters, um, probably the only thing that I would respond to there was it was it was raised by one of the submitters that um, it only takes one ember to escape from the landfill into the surrounding pine forest area to start a fire. And the, the key thing about uh, generating embers is that a fire needs to establish uh, sufficiently strong convection uh, in order to loft embers into the air so that they can be um, you know, blown forwards on the wind and land in some unburnt fuel and start a new fire. And uh, I was just listening to uh, Mr Dixon's evidence and one of the key ways that you really limit the potential for any fire in a landfill to generate enough convection to start lofting embers is by limiting the size available to burn. And the way, the way that is done is by limiting that active tip face area, the exposed waste. So if all the other waste is covered with an inert soil material, you've only got the exposed waste. And, a, and an area that's 300 metres, it's less than half of the in goal area on a rugby field. It's a, it's a pretty small area. Um, and a, a fire just simply will not um, uh, really have the opportunity to develop the very strong conviction that's required to start lofting large embers uh, that can be blown from uh, within the landfill, outside the landfill, to start another fire. So uh, when I responded to that particular uh, submission, um, that just provides some additional explanation to, to the response that I provided. Thank you. Happy to take questions now, eh? Yes. Okay. If I was any question. Hello, Mr. Demar. Um, I've just got one question for you, uh, and it relates to um, fire service response time. And I note in um, uh, Clause F, you've stated that a fire and emergency service response time of 30 minutes is considered adequate for landfill fire assistance provision. Uh, we've had a couple of submitters who have been concerned about emergency response times, and I, and I thought just for the record I should um, check that uh, are there any considerations here if um, a fire and emergency service response was required during peak traffic time? Um, has that been accounted for in your um, modelling there? Uh, look, I haven't um, taken into account uh, what the uh, congestion issues are in uh, Dunedin. Um, my uh, estimate that it would take 30 minutes was really based on just the, the uh, road distance from um, the Dunedin um, uh, fire service location out to the site. So no, I haven't taken into account um, congestion times. That's fine. We, um, we heard earlier from the transportation expert. Um, I, I posed the same question there, so I just wanted to flag that with you, but um, that clarified that question for me. Thank you. You're welcome. I've just got a couple of questions for you. Um, one is also in paragraph 14. Um, well, you've actually mentioned it somewhere else too, but I just can't find it at the moment. But I think you mentioned in your evidence three fires that you were aware of. Pukki Coal, uh, which is in the Waikato, uh, Puwera up in Whangarei, and Hampton Downs in the Waikato. 
Um, am I right in thinking that you knew about those fires or you've had some involvement in addressing those? Um, the first of the two fires that I, I think you mentioned, Commissioner, were raised in one of the submissions. And ah, right, that's where I've seen it, yep. Yep, and I haven't had, I haven't personally had any involvement in those particular fires, but I have read investigation reports by Fire and Emergency New Zealand into those particular fires. And the only comments I made around those fires were that they weren't anything to do with a landfill. Um, mm. that, and they didn't involve a landfill in the area that they burnt. Uh, and the Hampton Downs fire uh, that you mentioned, uh, yes, I have worked in a, on that particular fire in, a, in some legally privileged work that I've done with Mr Dixon in relation to that fire. Okay. So there's nothing that comes from our, any of those fires that actually need affect our assessments here from the comments you've made, apart from the, the confidential matter that you've just mentioned? That's correct. Um, and... Given your experience and that of Mr Dixon, um, would you gentlemen be the people who would prepare the fire preparedness and response plan for the applicant? Uh, that's certainly something that we, we could do and that we are experienced doing, um, but there may be others uh, that could be considered as well, but it's certainly something that we could do. Okay. That was all I had for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Just one question for me, in terms of your experience, um, how common is it for uh, the fire service um, in New Zealand, FENZ, having to get involved with dealing with landfill fires? How often does that occur as opposed to the on-site operators being able to deal with it on the spot? It's relatively rare for the fire service to need to be called in. Um, Sometimes the fire service can be called in, not out of necessity, but out of an abundance of caution. Um, and the, the other times that, uh, in my experience, that fire services tend to be called in is if there is a subsurface fire. Um, and that's mainly because those sorts of fires need a lot of water to, uh, to quench them. And so the, the fire services are able to deliver high, high volumes uh, of water in short periods of time. Uh, but subsurface fires are extremely slow spreading. They're underground. They're really not spreading at more than about a metre a day. So they're smouldering underground fires, but they, they require lots of water to put out. So in those sorts of scenarios, uh, they're, they're the sorts of scenario where uh, most landfill operators would uh, bring in the fire service and uh, the other uh, sort of scenario where uh, fire services are brought in are if a landfill opera really really hasn't been following good procedures so for example if a landfill operator is operating a landfill where they've left uh, very large areas uncovered or perhaps even using combustible uh, cover material well, then you can get a, a, a much larger fire, but provided that they adhere to a good practice for managing the landfill, then it's reasonably rare for fire services to need to be called in. Most fires are small and it can be dealt with by the on-site on uh, resources by either quenching uh, or smothering. And, and you may not be able to give or wish to give an answer to this, but from your experience, what percentage of Fires at landfills would require fire service attendance as a ballpark. A <coughs> oh, ballpark would be less than 10%. Yeah. All right, thanks very much for answering our questions. No further questions from us. Thank you very much, Mr. Demir. You're free to go. Thank you for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Commissioners, that brings us to a point where uh, we've been through everyone we have available today. Uh, we have Sam Webb available tomorrow 
Rhys Gervin and Samantha King, Landscape and Her Pathology, are en route to Dunedin from Christchurch and plan to be here for first thing in the morning. Yep. Um, we have Morris Dale who's been here all day. I'm kind of reluctant to have Mr Dale start now. You know, I don't want to uh, Mr We've Dale gone Dale. through, I think it's better, better that he be the anchor person at the end, having Absolutely, heard everything. Yeah. Uh, so we've had a good crack at it today. I suggest we pull stumps for now and yep. resume in the morning, at which time we'll have one, two, three more witnesses of technical nature, yep. uh, followed by Mr Dale. And what I will just do is check with my colleagues if we have questions for... Is it Mr or Mrs Gervin? Is it uh, Reese's or Mr? Is it? Uh, Reese Gervin's Mr, Mr Gervin. Mr yes. Gervin or Ms King. I'll just check if we have questions. Do you have any questions? Where are those, um, <coughs> Mr. Gervin and Miss King, you said they're at, where do they live? Are they? Uh, they're both Christchurch based. Oh, yeah. yes. So are they on their way now or have they already left? Uh, they were coming tonight. Uh, flight 7.15. 7.15 flight tonight. We could probably hear from them on Zoom, which oh, yeah. would save them attending and yeah, save okay. time and costs for everyone. We yeah. only have minor questions for them. Would okay. that be helpful? Yeah, no, that'll be much appreciated. We just, yep. No, yep. so we'll ask them to stand down and to come on Zoom tomorrow yeah, morning. Come on yeah, Zoom will be fine. No, that's much appreciated. Thank you very much for that. Yep. And so, uh, just before we adjourn, um, just two matters again, just for me. We've already covered them, but I just want to cover them again. So, in terms of the um, helpful responses, which are re it's really um, a form of rebuttal evidence, where you put the questions to your experts, and, and that's been helpful. We appreciate that. And we discussed timeframes for getting their written answers to us. Things have gone a lot quicker than we might have all mm. anticipated today. Mm. So where do you think, what sort of time frame do you think is reasonable for the experts we've heard from today to get their a you know, a written version of their verbal responses to the questions that you've put to them? We, already, we have one already that's been tabled. Yes. Um, <coughs> so most of them have, um, as you'll appreciate it, had sort of bullet point, just talking points. So it's not that they're starting from scratch. They yeah. sort of generally knew what they wanted to respond to, as you've seen. So, um, you know, we have asked that they sort of filter those through us, that we can just coordinate it and provide it to the hearing administrator. And one batch was our sort of plan, rather than them have it come in drips sure. and drabs to you. Sure. So. Um, I don't know, we're in your hands, but I think if at the conclusion of the case, if we had a couple of days, we'd be sort of combining all that and then sending it through is probably our intention. Okay. Yep. So, um, <coughs> that would be the end of Thursday? Yeah, what's today? Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, so let, let's assume we finish the case tomorrow. Um, yeah, then that's okay. right. So we'll aim for that. Aim for end of Thursday for bullet point responses to commissioners. Yeah. I think that should be perfectly achievable. Yeah. Um, <coughs> And again, just to reiterate, that's <coughs> only the responses they gave to the question you put to them about responding to the witness, the evidence of others. So questions we've asked, we've taken our own notes of those. Yes, absolutely. So it's just what, what they volunteered before you questioned. So yes, as I said, uh, they certainly had bullet points. So it'll just be making sure that they're coherent so that when you read them. Absolutely. And yeah, yeah. One, of, one of the witnesses said he wanted to add graphs, so that'll be included. Yeah, yeah. Yep. That's, no, that's good. And so just to return again to the um, document that I'll make available uh, first thing tomorrow, which will be um, Mr Dale's recommended conditions attached to his evidence with the track changes accepted solely for the purpose of this exercise, I'll have little comment box questions. Now, my, I don't have any expectation that Mr Dale would respond to those questions tomorrow. Yep. And the reason being, I, I expect he'll need to go away and think about that and, and on quite a number of those questions consult with the experts we've yep. already heard from. Yep. Um, and so some of the questions that I might have put to those witnesses I haven't because they will be in the annotated version yep. of those conditions and it's yep. better if Mr Dale talks to those experts and then comes back with, yes. a, with a view on that. Yep.
I just wanted to make sure that we don't expect Mr Dale to respond tomorrow yep. to that document. Um, that could either be preferably um, before we hear from the Section 42A officers so we can get their view on that if the timing works and if that doesn't work though that could, that could be as part of a reply but mm -hmm. maybe if you can just think about once Mr Dale's received that document, how big a job that is and whether you might be able to yeah. do that before we hear from the 42A team or whether it's a matter you'd want to do in a written reply. Yeah, I'll, we'll have a look at it and uh, certainly consult Mr Dale. I've, I've, I've asked him to perhaps be prepared to talk to you at a principal level in terms of some of the issues, if, to the extent he can, by tomorrow, sure. yeah. um, which might be helped to, at least in between yourselves and Mr Dale understand in principle what you're asking about. Um, yeah. But then, yes, he'll need to go away and consider yeah. it in detail. Yeah, and at any stage, once Mr Dale has had a chance to look at that document um, in full, um, we're happy to have him recalled and to put questions yes. to me to say, look, I didn't, Mr Chair, I didn't understand yep. your little cryptic comment yep. here. Can you tell me what you actually want me to think about? Yeah. I'm very happy for that to occur no. at any stage. It's yeah. convenient to Mr Dale. Yeah, thank you very much. And he's planning on being here for the duration, so that's appreciated. Thank you. All right. So just before I adjourn, um, just again, 42A team, anything you need to draw to our attention at this stage? Now I know Mr. Page, I see Mr. Page isn't here anymore. Um, just looking at the schedule, um, is there any opportunity or are you able to speak to Mr. Page or? Um, I think that we're still checking the availability of the witnesses. Yeah, great. So no, that's fine. I had asked my um, hearings administrator to liaise with Mr Page and see if there's any opportunity for us to hear from the airport tomorrow, uh, tomorrow mid-morning, later or afternoon, wherever we get to. So if that can happen, that will be good. Um, but with the submitters that we currently have scheduled for Friday, um, I'm loathe to move them from Friday because there's a number of um, what we call lay submitters and I imagine they've arranged to take time off work, mm -hmm. etc. So we'll just leave Friday submitted as they are. Yep. But we may be able to hear from the airport tomorrow. Uh, and if we do, that gives Thursday for um, 42 hour officers and Mr Dale to do some work for us. Mm. <laughs> so with that, if thank Mr Dale says anything you want to add at this point, we'll just adjourn for the day. No, thank you very much. We'll see you in the morning. Uh, right. Just check, confirm the time for tomorrow. Uh, nine o'clock. Thank you. Nine o'clock. Right, so we're adjourned for now. Reconvene at 9am in the morning. Thank you. Thank you.